And I believe we are finally live, trying to figure all this buttons. There's lots of buttons. Anybody like buttons? I like buttons. This, buttons this is Legends of the Drowned Isles, a homebrew D&D 5th Ed campaign, uh, where we have gathered for... Do we ever? Do we even know what the first day was? This, uh, November 2016 sometime. <laughs> well, and, yeah. That's a better month than I, I wouldn't have guessed, guessed November. So it was after nearly... November 16th. Okay. There we go. There we go. That's right. After Halcom was definitely one of the milestones I should have remembered. But uh, just about four years ago, we'll hit four years this, this fall, um, sort of after Halcon. Uh, Halcon just announced that they are not going to be having Halcon this year. So I don't I know. I mean, there's... good, but still sad. Yeah, yeah. It's, Not that I was going to go if they didn't cancel. <laughs> feeling, feeling unwanting to gather in large groups right now. Uh, but uh, I'm Mark the Encaffeinated One. I'm the host and GM of this uh, whatever it is. I just realized the mistake of not having my coffee this morning. <laughs> oh boy, this is going to be um, this is going to be a, a rush. How about that? Uh, we have been playing this game, as I said, since, or as, as was said, since November of 2016. But uh, due to social distancing slash technological limitation slash that's the way life is, uh, we are down one player from the main game. So this is an alt game set 1,000 years before the events of the current game. Getting a lot of echo here. Hopefully that's not going to be too distracting for all of us um and uh, thus it's entirely different characters with the players that could make it speaking of my players please introduce yourself starting on my left with silas hi my name is pat and i'm playing silas marsh illusionist hi i am marie and i am playing annie who is a rogue hey i'm max and i'm playing medrick half orc cleric also, I'm not sure, like, you know how we're not supposed to talk during, like, the opening music, and I talked because I, I just, like, got back? Did people hear Did people hear me? Anyway, there was a wasp emergency in my room. That's why I was, like, talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, for those of you at home, they heard nothing. I was able to hit okay. the right mute buttons to make it all happen. But uh, we return to the seaside town of Aelthwater and the... Uh, area known as the Sunken Coast, off the west coast of Uskus, in the land of Omatia. A little recap of what happened in the last episode. The group continued to move through rooms in a dreamscape, seeking to illuminate the beacons that drive back the nightmare creatures and release connections for the Gynosphinx Cathron. Far above them, they got a glimpse of the other battle, distant and indistinct, before returning to face off against more of the ethereal spider-like beings, including one that claimed ownership of the landscape, a half-birthed spider of tremendous size, and whose shadowing limbs threatened to consume them. In the end, however, it was the resilience of Medric's half-orc heritage and the burning power of the fire god Ignis that, that uh, allowed him to dispose of the creature from the inside after having been swallowed by it. It's a pretty epic uh, end of that particular battle. Yeah. Like, there's regular characters, then there's like jalapeno characters. <laughs> <laughs> Spicy. Don't even jalapeno characters. <laughs> the final beacon having been lit, the group were swept up in a series of confusing visions that seemed to come from the energies released. And I'll just repeat uh, or summarize them here. In yes. one, Medric found himself standing on a piece of wood floating on the salty sea and saw a woman-shaped shadow standing on another platform. The woman seemed to shift between elven, human, and gnome. She waved a handkerchief sadly out towards the deeper sea, but simultaneously reached back to hold the hand of someone else whom Medric could not see. In another, the group felt as if they were falling into the water, then flowing like water into glasses on a banquet table. Around them, small points of light illuminated little of the shadowy people celebrating around them. Medric was drunk by a shadowy face, drunk as liquid, with brilliant blue eyes. Silas was knocked over, and his glasses spilled, spreading out like thick, viscous liquid, to which the reveler seemed to rush to drink in. Uh, 
and Annie found herself hoisted above the table, looking down to see a body carefully split into several disconnected bloodless pieces, the round face of a young man with curly brown hair and brown eyes staring back at her, unworried. From within the body's torso, bloody pieces like cake were distributed to the revelers. Then the three of them found themselves dragged through another tunnel that glowed slightly silver and blue. It appeared to be underground as the wane yellow-red lantern light filtered through a grate overhead. The three flo flowed like water around a figure, dragging another through the gloom. The person dragged, dragged, uh, sorry, the person dragging had a soft face, bald besides hair at the very back of the head, marred by a large wound. They whistled a familiar old tune badly, one that Silas recalled about birds and the weather. They moved to a half-hidden door, and the figure is revealed to be short. They dragged the body into the flowing water into a square room, which then poured through to a zigzag-shaped box, before flowing through into a long rectangular box, where a vague laughter of the party can be heard. Next, they were all as rain, falling down upon birds overhead of Elthwater. One bird in particular struggled and fell from a high height and collided with the mud. A torch hung nearby, which then fell to hang upside down by its chain, swaying slowly back and forth. Then, sinking through the mud of the ground, they woken in, in their beds, soaked and muddy. The next day they met up at the Three Bells, trying to come to grips with what they had experienced. While there they saw and overheard the tax collector speaking to Sandy Bell. The taxes are to be collected twice a month now, and will be doubled, all to pay for additional guards due to increased bandit activity in the area. And that is where we concluded. I believe everybody went home for the night, took a nice rest, relaxation. Silas probably... tax evasion. You know? <laughs> yeah, there was a bit of confrontation about the taxes, but uh, names were taken, if not necessarily the right names. Uh, and, uh, and you found yourselves relaxing, still hovering perhaps on the edge of memory of mm -hmm. the things you had seen in the dreamlands before. So, the night passes, the day comes up. Tomorrow you are due to go back to see Wish and hopefully deliver the whatever it was uh, out to the cold back lighthouse. You have a day. If nothing specific comes to mind that you need to do or want to do, we can move on. That is up to you. I can't think of anything. Yeah, and it doesn't have anything specific. Okay. Um, uh, the list, the uh, short outline of the dreams, is that going to be like on the Facebook page or anything? Uh, I suppose I can clean it up a bit and post it. Yeah. Because I keep trying to write it all down and it's like, ah, I'm falling behind. <laughs> <laughs> and I get like flashbacks of like university when I'm trying to keep up. <laughs> the, uh, the episode is up on YouTube and I will say that I clipped out the audio of that particular description and then tried to summarize it a bit, so... Uh, I will try to, uh, and then as I'm reading it, I further <laughs> corrected some of the other errors. So I will try to clean it up and post it up on the Facebook group. So a couple of days pass in relative peace. The clouds have been gathering. Looks like there's going to be a heavy storm coming soon. Silas, you're used to this pattern. Storms will roll in off the sea. And kind of get caught a little bit in this this little cove, uh, this uh, this. Uh, pardon me, as I, I have to bring up my notes in Silver Moon Bay, as uh, ships also keep flowing in on a daily basis, running through high tide and low. Um, that day, you can all distinctly smell. Although Silas is probably so used to it not to notice that distinct uh, tang of, of salt and seaweed that blows in off the breeze and gives the, the town some of its permanent character. Uh, both Annie and Medrick haven't been here very long, but you started to get used to the idea that when you wake up, if you've left a window open, there will be that taste on your lips 
that you have to either wash away or get used to. That salty, seaweedy taste, it, it, it moves everywhere. If you don't uh, carefully wash your clothes every few days, you can even smell it kind of getting into the very essence. Um, and you've kind of noticed it on others, but as you've been here for a few weeks, you start to even lessen, lessen uh, that impact. But you awake. Do you gather the three bells has become your custom? Yeah. Sure. It's awake, grab breakfast, bacon. <laughs> Uh, there isn't a lot of customers this early in the morning, or rather this late in the early morning, if you will. Um, they're still cleaning up after the very early crowd, which would be the fishermen and the uh, and the sailors who would come in, get something to eat, or get some last-minute provisions before hitting the sea that day. So they're still cleaning up, but um, you're in that second wave, and Sandy greets you, as always, with a smile. Set some food before you, before you've even asked. There's fresh bread on the table uh, that her sister has made. And you can smell the the uh, the uh, distinct uh, sweet meat of bacon cooking in the background. It may be morning. I may have just had bacon and eggs. <laughs> I only had eggs because I was lazy. Hmm, same here. You're muted, uh, Annie. I just woke up, so I haven't eaten yet. Oh, no. <laughs> um, you gather to discuss the day. I'm assuming that uh, uh, Nikki isn't with you, Silas. No. No, he'd be ha back at home. Nobody can handle children this early in the morning, even though it's not super early. I heard no bacon handled children this early in the morning. Nobody. And I, and I, and I Same. Agree. Yeah. Same. <laughs> Both are technically true. I don't so know. Is today the day for the delivery? Today would be the day of the delivery. It's supposed to be ready. You were warned that it was going to be awkward and heavy. Great. Oh, I brought my horse then. I can lift it up and put it onto the wagon. You have a wagon for your horse, right? Nope. Hmm. No, I don't have a wagon. Just the horse. Can the horse carry it by itself, or is it going to be awkward? I don't know what it is, so I don't know. We'll have to wait till we see. We'll figure right. something out. What's that? We'll figure something out. I guess we'll know what to do. <laughs> anyway, crossing the streams here. Um, so do you think Buddy is going to be more pleasant this time around? Or is the conversation going to be like super awkward like last time? We might not end up even seeing him. All right. I imagine they've probably got it packaged up and ready to go. But well, if it's in a package or in a nice crate, that's going to make it less awkward to deliver or carry. Well, Silas will just wait till people finish eating and we can head off or whatever. All right. Medrick will just finish eating really quick. It's not a talkative bunch. As you sit around and uh, finish oh, off the uh, the bread... A, uh, a few other people filter in for the day. Um, Annie and Medrick, uh, make insight checks, please. Insight? 20. Right, I have my character sheet up somewhere. Fuck, I closed it. <laughs> I will get used to roll 20 someday. <laughs> Ooh, okay. It's really good bacon. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> um, yeah, you're you're focused on, on using the fresh bread to get that last little bit of, of bacon grease off your plate. Um, it is extraordinarily good. And you feel 
maybe a little distracted as you see the, the, the bread toasting a little bit in your hand, um, realizing that perhaps subconsciously you've called on a little bit of the power of Ignis to toast your bread. <laughs> it's a little distracting at the moment. Annie, and awesome. <laughs> Annie, you watch as uh, folks come in and kind of look over towards the table where you are sitting. Um, there's a, a, a sort of uh, passing glance of the symbol of Ignis uh, and the presumably armored, I, I don't know why, just it's a fantasy world. Everybody wears their armor all the time. Uh, Medric. Um, the eyes kind of pass over you. They don't seem to really pay much attention. Um but they, they see Silas, and you haven't recognized these folks. They haven't really come in. Probably you haven't come in that often this early in the morning. Um, but they come in, and there's a, a sort of double take. A look at Silas, and then there's a sort of second look uh, with a darker expression that passes across their faces, almost as though... They were wondering who this new person is, and then they realized who this person is. And then turn away quickly and go back to the, the bar to order up the, the stew, actually, which is the, the late or later or middle day meal. It's like they sort of recognize him, but don't. You finish up your meal, you gather your things, you step outside, your horse. What's your horse's name, Silas? I don't know. That's a strange name for a horse, but I will accept it. Um, or call him like Idik, like after the acronym IDK. <laughs> Idk. It's a, it's a regional <laughs> dialect. Um, let me see if I have my. my Let's list. Go to horseillustrated.com. <laughs> I have a list of names. Also, I do have the names of the kinds of horses that people use here. Right. I'm probably not going to call it something like Cleveland. It is a it, is, uh, it, it divides the land. It is a a large <laughs> hooves that dig. In general, gonna call it Blondie. There we go. Blondie. Okay. In general, what's your horse like? Is it a big horse, small horse, strong horse? Does it have Riding a... horse, so about medium sized. Okay. What color is your horse? Blonde. Right. <laughs> okay. I'll just bring up this overly large document that has everything in it. I really need to separate a few things out. It's my People of the World document, which is several hundred nice. pages long. <laughs> um, so I'm just noticing this now because it's morning. Did you do like the Viking braids differently? Uh, sort of, yeah. There's two, bra two braids on the side and I just tie in the middle. Cool. So I can show off for those at home. It doesn't look quite as <laughs> impressive, I think, on the camera. Also, my microphone cord gets in the way. This is what you do when you're stuck at home, I guess. Uh, all right, well, I'm not finding it. It's taking too long. Documents are, are, are dumb. So we will, <laughs> we will deal with that later. I was hoping you'd have a longer description so I'd have time to look, but I'm just wasting time now. So um, you all gather around. Do you walk the horse over or do you ride the horse over? What's your attitude towards the horse? The horse is our pet and our friend, and I ride it over because it's a riding horse. Okay. It's presumably saddle and bridle and all that. Mm-hmm. You all... Uh... When, you, when you first go out, I would, like, pet its face. It, it leans into it. Nice to get some attention as opposed to just being a horse. Uh, you ride through the streets over to the other side of town where the blacksmith's shop is. 
even with the the early morning and the somewhat heavy humidity, um, you can still hear vaguely and weirdly non-directionally the sound of hammers uh, beating metal from the shop. There's a uh, the smoke, the sort of greasy smoke that happens when they puff up the forge um, holds heavy in the air, and you can you gather that if you were used to it, you could actually find your way to the forge by smell and by temperature alone, um, and wandering through. There does seem to be. Uh, Someone talking to Wish. You see him off to the side, not actually working on something at the moment. Uh, it looks like someone with uh, an official uh, uh, nature, very clean, well-made clothing uh, of reds and whites. Um, Is it the tax guy? Sure. Yeah, why not? We'll have him have him because he is kind of a messenger, so he does kind of get around to a lot of things. Uh, speaking to Wish, and Wish seems to be um, kind of sourly faced, um, but nodding nonetheless, um, and then seems to protest a little bit. Uh, you're not sure if they're having the tax discussion, but that does seem to be the one the collector is going around uh, to a lot of people. Um, and the... and. Wish kind of uh, nods at the end and just growls at him. Next week. It will all be ready next week. And the tax collector seems satisfied and goes off. Wish notices you arriving, does the sort of partial nod of acknowledgement, but then turns to go deeper into the forge. Um, Yuri comes out a few seconds after that. Um, you get get the impression that he was sort of told to deal with you um, as it comes out to see the three of you oh good good you're here <laughs> um, oh uh, I was under the impression you might have a wagon mm, no, no look I, at just have, I just have a horse okay uh, well, if we need a wagon I suppose we can rent one in town somewhere you you probably will want to um, come with me, and he kind of pulls you over to the side of the of the forge, and there are many different crates there. Um, some of them are already uh, packed up and have a a, a a a painted name on them for delivery to different places. Some of them are labeled Pitajune. Some of them have um, what are probably different caravan names or caravan master names. Uh, on them uh, as if they're ready to be shipped out a few of them seem like they're they're in the process of being opened up as well so this essentially is the import export side of the business uh, and he gestures towards uh, one crate uh, which has uh, a coal pack written on the side of it uh, special delivery essentially uh, written as well the crate is uh, rough hewn wood it's about uh, three foot on a side so a fairly large, uh, squarish crate, um, nailed, uh, nailed closed at the moment. Um, that's, um, that's what you'll be carrying. I don't think you can fit that on the horse, uh, but, I mean, you're welcome to try. The crate itself is, is just old wood. It's, a, it's fairly light. It's been dried, but... Uh, inside the item has been wrapped in straw uh, and it's um, somewhat heavy. I'll try picking up the crate. Okay. What's your strength? Just to, just to like feel how, I, how, how heavy it is. Okay. Strength is 16. 16. Um, it is extraordinarily heavy. Uh, you are able to kind of lift up the corner and kind of heave it. You couldn't walk very far with this. I can put this on a wagon, but uh, walking with this for several hours is going to be a no-no. Mm. You also kind of get the sense of, of the weight inside is is mostly in the center. And as you kind of lift up one corner, you can kind of feel things shifting slightly on the inside. 
it's yeah, not that, secure. Yeah, that would be <laughs> Well, yeah. Uh, if they don't yeah. have a, a uh, cart here, then yeah, we'll go have to rent one. Okay. I mean, I'm sure the profits we'll make from the delivery will more than offset the cost of the wagon. Um, out of character, I'm not sure we're getting paid for this. There was originally no he said he had a job for us, but then pre then after that you said that it was an additional part of getting the armor made. So I'm not sure exactly uh, whether we're getting paid or not. Wish never mentioned money. It was hmm. kind of implied as a favor to be done. Yep. So if you guys don't want to come, I can uh, rent a thing and bring it myself, but. Uh, if you want to, that'd be fine too. Where are we taking? How much is the wagon? Have you rented wagons before? Oh, it's probably not much. If you're only okay. renting it, it's a, it's a, like a, a couple of silver. Oh, yeah, day. whatever. Um, it's to be delivered. So we don't need like scanning rims on the wagon or anything. <laughs> well, I mean, the the rims will spin, but only in the normal way. Yeah. Um. Yuri tells you it's to be delivered to the Cold Pack Lighthouse. Yeah, so but the, how far away is the Cold Pack Lighthouse? It's, um, about a couple of miles. Okay. okay. So that's um, nothing big. You can kind of see it, um, and certainly at night, the light from the Cold Pack Lighthouse um, on the sort of south shore, or southern edge of uh, the bay. Uh, a couple of miles is probably wrong. It's a few hours away would be the better way to put it. Okay. Um, Silly but, question. Uh, Colpack is C O L P A C K. Um, there's a D in there. It's Cold Pack. Okay. But people will pronounce it as Cold Pack. Um, Silas, you're familiar with the area, having lived here. This is right around the uh, Dead Men's Fingers, which is a pretty nasty uh, collection of shoals uh, that do take a lot of boats, and so the lighthouse is. Uh, an absolute necessity for navigating to come in from usually from the south and southwestern edge of the bay. Um, yeah, it burns continuously, um, and even during the day they still burn it because it's still uh, the light still hangs in the fog. Um, they do have uh, an enormous horn that they'll ring in the in the deepest of fogs to try to give additional warning. Uh, you'd also know that it's run by the Frey family, F-R-E-Y. Uh, it's been in the family for at least three generations, as far as you know. But you would not have met any of the Frey members. Okay. So you head to a local livery, uh, rent a small cart. Are you getting one large enough that everyone can ride on, or just one big enough to hold the, uh, the necessary? Because you can get really small cargo carts yeah probably just a small one big yeah. enough to hold that because i mean i'm going to be walking anyways so okay. it's only a couple of miles so a couple of silver is all it costs um it takes a little bit to kind of attach it to your horse um who uh is there a such thing as insurance for wagons like what if what if what if, what if we get attacked by bandits and they break the wagon then we probably have to buy them a new wagon that would be the, the you, you you break it you bought it kind of policy. They aren't that expensive um, to make, but they're still annoying to have to make. <laughs> they are they yeah. are and also, you know, they have lost some carts recently. Um, you can see they only have a few, and they they they've been repaired. They, these are working carts. These are not fancy carts. Uh, every cart that's there has sh shows sign of having been worked and reworked and patched. It's the old uh, the old philosophical quandary: is it the same cart if every piece has been replaced at least once? <laughs> but very rough hewn wood. It takes you a while. Um, what's your uh, animal handling, Silas? Mm. An 11. With the guidance of the livery uh, uh, assistants, you're able to kind of work out how all this is supposed to go together. 
Um, the horse seems a little bit annoyed by the whole process. Uh, as you said, it's kind of been been uh, born and bred and, and raised and used as a riding horse. I scratch it behind the ears. Um, It'll be okay, girl. It starts uh, nibbling away at your coat looking for sugar cubes. <laughs> I grab it some sugar cubes. <laughs> Are they illusory, illusory sugar cubes or real ones? <laughs> no, they'd be real. I think the He's horse. Not play a trick on his horse. Yeah, the horse would learn from that trick pretty quick too. Uh, they probably would. I'm not entirely sure it'd be affected. A lot of those have a require a minimum intelligence of three to be fooled. That's just weird. When you and think I, about I it. think horses only one or two. I'm not smart enough to be fooled by your illusion. Another well, maybe like after a... I think you have to, I think you have to be affecting a proper mind. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily just a physical illusion. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. But according to psychological research, like wouldn't the horse get like I don't know after a certain amount of times it gets fooled? Wouldn't it be like rolling out advantage and then like if it gets fooled a bunch of more times, then like rolling with a modifier well, to like? Yeah. Well, if it can if it can see them, I think anything with an intelligence <laughs> less than three just doesn't see certain types of. Uh, you know, I think you just flipped my entire perception of how illusion is supposed to work in this game. Oh no, sorry. Because I've always thought I said of it nothing. As, I said nothing. I've always thought of it as a physical Medrick illusion. Medrick can't come up with these comments because he's got an inch of eight. But if it's actually a trick in the mind, that's a whole different thing. I think it, I think it depends on the spell. Like the spells will say which one uh, mm. is it. The minor one might not have that, but uh, well, but yeah. That revelation aside, an actual sugar cube is given to the horse. The wagon is attached. <laughs> You turn back. I do it so it doesn't start eating Gideon's uh, pocket. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> How does Gideon behave generally? Like, is Gideon a curious like creature? Snake, so probably kind of lazy, but occasionally perking his head up and taking a little fly around because he's also part bird. So imagine a lazy hummingbird. <laughs> that doesn't even compute. It's like fly, look, fly, look, fly, look, sleep. More like Rest. fly, look, eat. Eat, fly, look. It's like a flying cat, basically. <laughs> Somewhat, yes. You return back to the uh, blacksmiths. Yuri actually offers to help load this onto the wagon. Uh, although Yuri is, is, uh, looks fairly slender, um, you can kind of see that uh, he's one of those people who doesn't develop large muscles, just very toned muscles. And he has been working in the blacksmith, even though he's mostly an assistant, it seems, in the business end of things. Uh, still seems surprisingly strong. And between him and Medrick, you're able to heave this, this box up onto the back of the cart. I help. Easy. I am newly buff. <laughs> <laughs> well, At least less unbuff. Between the three of you, it does uh, uh, seem to to make it a little easier, but it it has it, it is weird inside because as Medrick discovered earlier, um, there is definitely the the central object inside, which is not attached to anything. It just sort of seems to be, as I said, uh, uh, packed in with straw. So um, it becomes kind of awkward as the the weight inside shifts if you're not careful and keeping it perfectly balanced. Um, Yuri pats uh, the, Yuri pats the box um, gives you a rolled up piece of paper um, please have them sign when they've accepted delivery of course sure and he kind of for a moment looks a little nervous kind of looking around I know that there have been reports of um, bandit activity so, please be careful. Was the tax guy just here to say that your taxes would be doubling too? Uh, well, I mean, taxes will be shifting, but he was placing an order. Um, okay. The only good side of this that's happening is that, well, there's an increased demand for arms and armor. And that's something that Wish is very good at. I mean... The master's very good at it. So they're uh, placing an order for the guards that they're going to be hiring? Yes. Uh, at uh, uh, two-thirds our normal rate. Uh, so it's... I imagine 
Deloishes liked that. <laughs> Let's just say I'm glad he has some very heavy metal to pang on right now. Mm. Understandable. And in fact, as you speak, you can hear uh, there had been hammering this entire time, but it may be Wish who's who's uh, taken up the hammer at the moment because it sounds twice as loud and the ringing kind of goes everywhere and all the other hammers stop for a second or two. Uh, kind of like, you know, you kind of get this impression they're all stepping back a couple of feet, perhaps. Hmm. Well, shoot, what was his name again? Yuri. Yuri. Well, thank you, Yuri. We will make sure it is safely delivered. Good. He wouldn't say it, but I think the master would be pleased. Now we'll bring back a piece of paper. Good, good. That's very important. If you don't have yeah. it, then somebody has to go in and actually verify that they received it, and it's another trip. We'll make sure we have the paper and that a name is on it. <laughs> it the might correct. be the name. Okay. Well. All right. We set out I'll walking. Start out. out. There is a road that leads uh, eastward, or sort of, yeah, eastward out of town, and follows most of the route around. Uh, it kind of follows the coast as well. You hear the slight rumble of thunder uh, as the overcast cloud clouds are promising perhaps a little more rain for that day. Um, the seas are starting to churn a little bit from the additional wind, and you can see that the the water is flowing in. You're gonna be on the you'll be on the high road though around the coast, which means you don't have to worry about the when the bay floods with its massive high tides. You do see waiting boats though just out into the sea. About three of them right now, um, possibly four. The way that the clouds and the fog is obscuring things makes it a little difficult to figure out if you're seeing one um, boat which is moving and tipping back and forth, or whether there's actually another one behind it. Uh, but they seem to be eager to come in. Uh, light rain does indeed start after about um, half an hour into the journey, and as well as a cold breeze that picks up the fog once again thick. The road is mostly cobbled, you get the impression that this was an old, old road, probably built by a kingdom long ago as a trading route, perhaps along the coast. But since then, no one really has taken up the effort to fill in the cobblestones which go missing or to uh, replace the, the grout to keep the road from sinking down into the mud once again. As you travel along the coast, it's deeply wooded to your right as you pass in. In fact, to your right would be where you would have gone the previous time, the branch off the road that had led to the Wilmot, uh, or the uh, Wilmot, Wilmot? Wintrip, the Wintrip farm. Wintrip. Um, passing along there. At one point, you do actually find the remains of a wagon. Looks like it's been burned um, and broken, perhaps, along the side of the road. Stop for a minute and just check it out. Yeah, is it still hot? Like I'll put my hand directly on it <laughs> because I miss. It it does. It's not hot. the The rain that's been kind of uh, lightly pelting down probably would have taken care of any flames that had been burning recently. Uh, but there is a slight amount of heat, as though it's not been longer than a day, and only the innermost embers had not yet um, been out. This each, was done pretty recently, like less than a day. Each of you can make an investigation check. Oh yeah. Mm. Oh wait, that's int. God damn it. Okay. Marie, you're I'm having of... a today. You're kind of stepping, or Annie, you're kind of stepping back and surveying the scene, trying to take the whole thing in 
But every time you start looking over it, the rain kind of dribbles into your eyes and you end up finding yourself half rubbing your eyes more than actually seeing anything. Uh, the, the fog is also kind of distracting. And even from where you are, only a few feet away, the wagon itself already seems somewhat obscured by that. The light is also dim uh, as the clouds have thickened uh, and more rumbles of thunder can be heard off in the distance. Um, for Silas and Medrick, Medrick, you've got, walked right up to it and they're starting to, to grab onto the, the wood and just sort of pull it apart. Um, it is thoroughly uh, charcoal now. And your hand is covered with the, the sort of black ash of what remains. You find a box that seems to have tumbled off of it at one point and landed more or less underneath the rest. The box itself is charred on the outside. It did get caught in the flames, but it seems to be somewhat intact. Um, for Silas, um, you're kind of looking around uh, and you find what you did not hope to find. You find the body of a young man, partially burned, but that's probably not what killed him. A large wound in his shoulder that, that uh, stretches all the way down across his chest uh, seems to have been something more likely a, a, an axe or maybe a, a, a sword struck him. Okay. Then he was half buried in the wreckage. So Silas found both those things, or was one of them me? Because you said Silas both times. Oh, did I? Sorry, Medrick, yeah. you were the one that found right. the uh, the box. Okay. I found the box. Now I'll just, like, crack it open. Or is there, like, a closing or locking mechanism for it? Or? It's a crate, essentially. Okay. Um, I it's... have a crowbar. Oh, open that. Okay. Annie walks by with a crowbar. Where she keeps a crowbar, <laughs> nobody asks. Uh... <laughs> It's easy to crack open. Again, it was kind of half burned, so the the uh, the wood kind of splinters and cracks a little bit as you open it up. Uh, inside, you find well, I mean, it's it's only a practical choice. Uh, it's on a, it's on a chain around her neck. I just imagine now. Crowbar necklace. No. Annie Crowbar is her new name. Uh, you crack it open. And inside you see uh, small bags, each labeled. Um, there's a bit of, of, of straw being used to kind of hold it all together. Some of the straw itself uh, is, is smoky, but luckily did not ignite. The wood outside may have been soaked by water or something like that to, to prevent it from completely burning in. Uh, because if this had been exposed, the whole thing would have been burned. Uh, you see a number of small pouches, each labeled with... Uh, and, and names you're not really familiar with, uh, but a few of them you recognize. There's something that says saffron, something else that says um, rosemary. Uh, there's a few other things. And you start to realize this is a box full of spices, some of which are exotic, some are not. There's also a couple of large bags there that are, are, are stiff. Uh, uh, they're kind of uh, sealed, sewn-up sacks, uh, each at about... Oh, let's say a, a few pounds each. They're absolutely full, and you can feel a texture of, of uh, small, hard, round on the inside. Giving you a sniff, it has a familiar uh, waft. Uh, there's a couple of, of bags of coffee uh, in this small crate, as well as the, the spices. Hey, we should probably can bring I this back in three bells if we're not going to sell it. What was that? Can I take a look at the coffee? Uh, you certainly can. Um, you can. Take a look and turn it over. Um, they're solid bricks of beans. Mm -hmm. um, are you going to open up the sacks, or they're 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 sewed so shut? Oh, they're they're sewed so shut. Um, can I smell it? Sure. Through the bag. Uh, Annie kind of heaves the, the 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 bag up and takes a long uh, draft out of the the side of it. Uh, the first thing you smell, of course, is sort of the burlap that's used to wrap these up, which is itself kind of has a bit of a strong smell. Um, but within, you can you feel there's a a certain spiciness um, that comes from only a particular kind of bean that's grown uh, a long ways away from here. Um, it would actually be on the island of Alaria. They actually grow this kind of bean, which would be one of the places you've you've run across it before. Um, 
it's a it's a high end coffee. This is not a a uh, a casual drink at the you know the Sandy provides herself on on decent food and vittles at the uh, Three Bells. She could probably not afford to to make this have this kind of coffee. Like this is something that I would drink. Yeah, yeah. it's just something that the this is something that the Baron would drink. Um, so the, you get the impression that, especially looking at the the spices that are there, uh, some of the names you're more familiar with, um, and these are 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 not your table spices. These are cooking spices. This was this was a pot box intended, probably for the Baron, or probably you know a, a very wealthy uh, uh, merchant perhaps. And maybe they were just passing through. Maybe this was intended to go through to Pitajun. You're not sure. Be a weird route for Pitajun though. Interesting. This is some really high-end coffee. And well, I know the coffees. Does it taste the same as regular coffee, though? <laughs> oh, no. This is like... This is from where I'm from. This is... This is some high-end stuff that I don't think many people here could afford. I wonder where it was going. But no, oh, none taken on the battlefield. I was used to drinking three-day-old cold coffee. No problem as long as it gets you awake. Oh, this would get you awake, all right. Should we uh, keep a little bit of it for ourselves? Uh, I'm taking a look at the body. Mm-hmm. Um, How are we digging him out? and getting him ready to uh, move off to the side of the road and uh, put a cairn around him. Uh, but I'm also going to check if he's got any uh, identification papers or uh, possibly a order form to fulfill. You start looking him over, pulling him out. The, the mud has gathered around him a little bit from the rain that's been going on that, that you can also see that his clothing is a little bit burned because he ended up lying close to the fire, but it doesn't look like he himself suffered too much from being burned. It was most likely the, the strike across the, the chest, which unfortunately did him in. Looks like a young man. You would gauge possibly between 20 and 30, but it's really hard to tell. Dressed for the road, wearing very uh, very heavy leather coat, uh, which now is somewhat in tatters. As you kind of move him over and move him around, you notice that there's another wound in the back, uh, cutting the coat uh, in a in a nasty uh, swath right about in the middle of the back. Like a small arrow wound or a big stab wound? Um, make a medicine check to kind of know the difference. Oops. Not my character sheet. Yeah, unfortunately, it's 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 a nasty looking wound either way, and there is a fair amount of blood that's sort of dried up and caked a little bit there. Uh, definitely from. Sorry. Have a look too. Yeah. To determine like what might have caused the wound, so a medicine check. Yep. Actually, I'll give you advantage on this because you were a battlefield medic. Although it doesn't seem like you need it. <laughs> well, I know everything that happened to him. <laughs> so yeah, as yeah. as Silas kind of rolls him over and starts to to look a little closer and kind of sits him up a little bit, um, the body has not yet achieved a full level of stiffness, but you do get a little bit of of uh, of resistance. Uh, the body is not as pliable as it could have been. But as as uh, I'm going to murder a lawnmower here soon. Uh, as uh, you uh, kind of take a look. Uh, and from your experience, uh, yes, he probably was struck in the back by a, a an arrow or possibly a spear. Um, there is no arrow there. There's no arrowhead stuck in the wound. Uh, but it was very, very sharp and pointed uh, and pierced through. Um, and then probably um, the other wound on his chest was delivered afterwards, um, struck down. And from someone with a fair amount of experience... Um, you're definitely picking up the fact that it was probably an axe wound from a very large axe that was uh, heaved up and smashed down upon his his shoulder first and then dragged along his chest. 
And between the two of those, he, he would have gone down pretty quickly. Um, you also get the impression that he's not really a fighting person. Um, he is uh, lean and probably had um, you know, a fair amount of road time, but not necessarily any military time himself. Uh, to further describe the young man, um, slightly palish skin uh, with uh, very short, uh, close-cropped blue hair. Uh, the blue seems to be natural. It's not washing away in the water. Um, from your experience, um, I trying to think who had the, the better perspective on this, probably Annie, weirdly enough. Um, the blue hair being natural probably indicates some elven heritage, although he does not oh. seem to have a lot of, uh, of elven features. Uh, doesn't have uh, any extended ear points, um, nor is the face completely all that um, narrow and long. Uh, but probably elven, uh, probably half elven, but maybe distantly half elven. Um, does not appear to have any papers on him as you search through the body. Um, and there's no inventory in the burnt crate. Uh, not an inventory as such, but there were labels attached to the different bags of uh, of, of spices, uh, in a very uh, beautiful handwritten uh, labels, but no overall um, inventory. So bandits would just kill the guy and leave the expensive things here. That makes no sense. Well, where you no. found the crate though was kind of off to the side. Um, Thinking about it, it the, the the crate might have slipped off if the wagon lurched, because there's nothing else here. There's no other crates. There's no other bags of anything. Um, it was thoroughly cleaned out and then lit on fire. Interesting. Are there any footprints, like based on where the arrow might have been shot from, and somebody walking up to the wagon with a big axe, like? Um. Just a moment. I'm going to close a window to see if I can attempt to mute a uh, a lawnmower that's at least bothering me, if not you guys. Just a second. I can't hear it. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's probably just bothering me more than any. Of course, it just went behind the building. Okay, I'm going to power through. Um, I hear a light buzz, but not enough to tell it's a lawnmower. Yeah, it's like weak coffee. It's just a light buzz, but not really satisfying. Just <laughs> really annoying. Um, so... Uh, you kind of look around and survey the site. Unfortunately, you, you kind of realize pretty quickly that the, the rain, even though it hasn't been really, really strong, is already making the ground pretty soft. Um, let's see here. I really need to bring up someone's character sheet so I can see what these look like. Uh, I don't have your characters. <laughs> All right, then. And we'll look at something else. You know what they haven't really done for me yet? They haven't invented a cheat sheet for digital gaming. <laughs> I have plenty of ones that are fitting on my, my screen in front of me, but I don't have them here. Um, what would... Okay, well, let, me, let me turn this around to, to Medric. What would you think would be an appropriate skill role to survey and try to understand how the battle happened here? Yeah. I'm assuming I can't use a medicine roll like to spot the angle at which the arrow came. No, no, it's not really CSI uh, Aelthwater. <laughs> uh, probably, well, looking for footsteps might, might be survival. Hmm. Like tracking, kind of, or nature, but nature's not as good. <laughs> no, it wouldn't be nature, um, unless the trees themselves are killing people. Uh, <laughs> In which case, we have bigger problems. <laughs> let me Let me note that down for later. Uh, let's okay, say survival. Yeah, survival is kind of looking around, trying to understand how the the layout goes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Again, with the the obscuring, uh, the mud starting to build up a little bit, the road itself being hard, uh, where there's cobblestones, uh, doesn't really leave footprints. It's kind of hard to tell. Um, judging from the angle, the, the, 
the rider was heading towards Ailthwater, unless the wagon got turned out and turned around entirely, so they were following along this road. Um, and judging from where they probably were sitting in the front of this wagon, um, the arrow probably came from the woods side. And there's plenty of cover that would be easily able to hide in that direction. Um, they didn't take the cart. And while carts aren't exactly expensive, uh, mm -hmm. there would, would have been a fair amount of stuff on this cart, uh, which suggests to you that they probably didn't travel via the road. Uh, because they probably didn't have a cart of their own. Uh, because otherwise, just take the cart. But they did take yeah. the horse. Um, I'll go inspect the, the woods where I think the arrow came from. And okay. I'll let my friends know what I'm doing. Okay. If you guys can find footprints, let me know. I think Silas is still engaged with kind of checking out this this person. Uh, you do find a small uh, dagger, just a a simple dagger, although it's well made. Um, it probably would have uh, produced a good price. It's kind of stuck in a um, a sheath underneath the arm, so when they would have been looking him over uh, quickly. They would have been, they could potentially have missed it, uh, especially if the attack happened quickly and he had no chance to actually draw it. It isn't much of a weapon, but it would have been a defense if he'd had a chance to draw it out. Um, also, looking at the coat, um, it was a, a, a weathered coat. It had probably survived many, many a, a, a weathered day. Um, it's a little bit large on him. And to you, that kind of implies that there was probably, this is the overcoat. And he probably would use this in the wintertime just with an inner layer. So it's bigger to accommodate that. Uh, but the, there's an inner pocket on the, uh, the right-hand side, opposite to where the, the, the strike actually hit on his left shoulder and carried on through. And the inner pocket is stretched out. Uh, it, is, it is leather like the rest, but it, it clearly was the place he would have kept a bundle of documents. Uh, probably would have been his manifest and his uh, his personal documents as well as uh, his uh, uh, his uh, any letters he would have been carrying as well, because uh, you know that caravans yeah. and others would also take on mail delivery uh, because it's a fairly lightweight but usually a premium product you can carry. But uh, the pocket it's stretched out. It's obvious that it was there, but there's nothing there now. Yeah. I'm going to pull them off to the side while they're searching around, and I'll start uh, putting rocks and such over them. Okay. And Medrick's going over towards the woods to kind of take a closer look to try to figure out where the ambush might have happened from. What is Annie doing? Um, I'm going to take the crate of spices back to our car um, and keep an eye on our stuff. Okay. The uh, There's plenty of space. Um, it's not a huge box. I'm talking a box probably about two about feet wide feet. by about, yeah, roughly two feet wide by about eight inches um, uh, uh, deep, I guess you might say, and only probably, probably about six or eight inches tall as well. It's a, it's one of the, it's a, it's a, it's a simple box, but it's, it's one of those, here are some really important things in a, in a, its own separate box rather than being bundled in with other things. Um, take a scan around the horizon. You can see the waves uh, beating up against the, the shore. Um, the fog has gotten thicker again. And you see the, the, the streak of light that's coming from the lighthouse. You can actually see it as it sort of cuts through the fog along the horizon. Uh, but no sign of anybody coming or going. Um, the horse is a little bit nervous every time there's a bit of a rumble of thunder. You can kind of see the flash of lightning off in the distance as well, um, deeper into the to the uh, sea side. You're you're about halfway around the cove at this point. Um, I'm going to try to calm the horse a little bit. I have some some grain. Okay, uh, make an animal handling check. It's not a really hard one at this point, but yeah, um, the horse appreciates the attention and the distraction as well. Um, a firm hand on the on the the reins to kind of keep it uh, focused more or less on you every time the, the thunder rolls, and it it greedily uh, crunches down on the grain as well. 
um, and does so quickly and and probably uses its big tongue as well to because the grain would be starting to already get a little soggy from the rain that's happening uh, and kind of scrapes it off your hand um, and, and kind of leans into you as well that that sort of that sort of show of, of mutual affection as well as you seem to be normal that's much better than everything else <laughs> Medrick, as you peer into the woods and take a few steps in, um, it's a little bit more dry in here. There's a thick enough canopy overhead that the rain, while it is falling through, is slowed down. Um, in fact, you can see it more coming down in rivulets along the sides of the bigger trees that are here. Mostly uh, deciduous trees, so the, the leaves at this point are, are thick and green and overhead. Uh, the sound is a bit overwhelming though as you enter because it, it kind of starts to roar a little bit if you will with the the leaves and the over the overhang being pelted by rain kind of like a massive drum uh, with no particular rhythm uh, as you step in a few feet you start to see areas where the ferns have been kind of pushed aside a little bit the 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 moss has been rubbed in one particular tree um, you get the impression kind of surveying inside only going in 10 feet, and you look back, and you can barely see the road at this point. Uh, it's just, it's the, the difference between the, the uh, uh, thickness of the trees and the way the light is going. Um, they couldn't have been much further in than this, uh, but you do find a place where someone probably was kneeling, uh, ready to go, uh, and uh, kind of looking back. Uh, I don't know if you're an archer. I don't know if you've ever... I have Abo, but... Yeah, usually prefers like Warhammer for the face. <laughs> from from the angle where you're looking, uh, and you're kind of thinking about it, um, and kind of trying to figure out, because they would have been low, which is a little lower than a bow, bowman would like to be there, unless they're using an arc. Um, you realize fairly quickly, and actually you see a little notch in the the tree beside as well, and realize they fired a crossbow, probably a heavy crossbow. Uh, and they were too close to the tree when they fired it and nicked the tree. Okay. Um, which means they probably had to reload. But that would account for the sort of large blunt wound on the back. And whoever it was also picked up their crossbow bolt afterwards because it should have been still there, either lodged in him or just lying around nearby. Okay. So... Do I see any footprints like where they went, kind of? Or? Um, you can make another survival roll in here to try to determine further. Okay. Nice. As you're looking around and the rain has not yet obscured everything, you can kind of make out a path that goes deeper into the woods. You're not sure how far it goes. Uh, and again, it's very, very dark in here, so uh, it doesn't... Uh, You'd have to follow it along, but if you wanted to, you you feel like you could actually trace back uh, the direction which they came from. Hey guys, do we have time to like uh, follow this trail? I think we should make our delivery first. Yeah, I don't think I don't want to leave our our uh, our package here while we go check that out. And. Can I see like a path kind of in the woods or is that mainly footsteps? Because if the path is there, we can probably like pick it up later. It, it's mostly you see footsteps and every few, every little while you see a, a broken uh, little branch or a, a fern. It's more of that it could be a trail to follow. It's not a an obvious trail. Okay. So we'll just remember like where this spot is and maybe on the way back we can check it out. Yeah. I mean, we'll see the burned out... Uh... Yeah. cart anyway it's like if it's a trail bandits use often we can just wait here for them yep uh i i want to get our delivery out of the way first yeah i'll go back out of the woods okay you also have a feeling that that uh you probably should report the the bandit activity uh yes back to the guards as well yeah and it gives you a sense that while you had encountered some bandits before, it does seem like this is more and more common uh, around here. You head back yeah, to the road. Um, Silas has has uh, 
taken the young man's body and pulled it off to the side and started assembling some stones, assuming the rest of you help at least, at least a little bit. It doesn't take too long to, to cover uh, the body with the cairn. Realizing, too, that the, the, the body, while it had been damaged from the wounds, had not been nipped at by animals, which means it hadn't been there that long. Mm. Um, after a while, though, you have the cairn in place. The rain now has started in earnest, and it's brought with it cooler temperatures. You can actually see your breath as you work with the last few stones, and they're starting to all feel somewhat soaked. So I've got my hat and my oilskin coat. I have my cloak, but it's not super waterproof. In fact, Gideon is out kind of enjoying it a little bit, uh, diving around the rain, enjoying the water on his scales. Um, for those who don't know at home, or, or many like me who often forget, uh, Gideon is a little flying snake, which usually lives in Silas's pocket. It's a snake bird. I would have my hood up, but it's not the most uh, rain protection. It's it's yeah, it's more than a casual rain kind of thing. And you're all starting to feel a little chill to the bone. You continue back on the road. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Kept me in suspense. Uh, you continue moving along, and the bay now is starting to curve outward so at up to this point you'd been kind of following the the concave element of the bay now you're starting to reach that that turning point where the bay starts to the landscape starts to turn the other direction uh, the road in fact starts to deteriorate rapidly but there is a branch which goes off inward uh, traveling more uh, more northward this would be probably the the, the main route whereas the rest of the route along the coast is, is just for coastal use. Um, so the trading path probably that that merchant came through was that northern route. Uh, that takes you to, well, it's northern from this perspective, but it probably follows the coast uh, more uh, southeastern. Uh, it probably turns again. You also know, Silas, that this area is not heavily inhabited. Aside from the farms, which are further inland, not a lot of people live along the coast right here. Uh, the coast tends to have very steep cliffs, uh, making it difficult to have any sort of fishing. Uh, and then where the stones are higher, uh, it's also uh, uh, fairly scrub land as well, so it's not really good for farming either. Um, usually it's described as, as just wasteland, essentially, uh, where no one cares to bother going. The only thing that's really here is the road that goes through it. And even that has become less popular. The road into Pitajun, the one that goes straight, uh, straight south, uh, sorry, straight north uh, east. I'm trying to remember my orientation because my map is not north south. Uh, but the one that the one that uh, heads directly to Pitajun, the, the King's Road, in fact, is well maintained, and seems to be the place where most of the caravans tend to go. So the fact that he was even taking this road is a little unusual. However. When the branch happens, you're not traveling along that older and but uh, but better maintained road. Instead, you'll be sticking to the coastal road, the one that will actually take you along towards the Keys. Uh, even just a, yep. Uh, um, oh, just uh, Tyler's going to say something while we're traveling, but yep, go ahead. Click on the description. Nope, go ahead. Um, I was going to say it's a bad omen. Uh, what is encountering death on the road so quickly? I don't know. Turned on fine. It turned out fine last time. Only a few near death experiences. I don't know. Just maybe we'll see. But we'll stay uh, vigilant and. About those things we saw, the visions we had before, it looked like in one of those that, I mean, things were, uh, it'll just say as we're walking along, 
things are consuming us. Yeah, people in a banquet. If you could call it the same dream, right? Sorry, can you repeat that? We were talking at the same time. <laughs> you can call them people. Yeah. Yeah. It's. It made me think. Uh, about uh, you, Medrick. Huh? Well, you have your god Ignis, and he gives you abilities, but he has a cost as well. Oh, yeah. One that I'm slow getting used to. Were those things that we we were seeing, were they gods or other things? None that I recognized. I just remember seeing a face with bright blue eyes. But I and think they're out of the cup. I mean, this sketch. I'd rather be drunk than be drunk. Wait, what? <laughs> I mean, visions are there to show us things, aren't they? Someone was trying to tell us something. I wonder if Catherine knows anything about these. I do want to talk to her again at some point. In fact, I wonder if the Flamekeeper knows anything about these. We don't really deal with water-related matters, however. I would guess not. I don't know anything about the other visions, but just... He looks at the, uh, kind of looks at the the staff where he's got his uh, little crystal thing on the end of it, and I just kind of wondered. Well, the rain reminds me of that last vision. Although there was a hanging torch, that was fire. I have no idea what it means. Hmm. Well, I think uh, Silas after that would be kind of kind of quiet, just keeping an eye out around him. You can feel the the weight on the brim of your hat as Gideon has decided that's where he wants to sleep for now, in the exposed rain, and yet in a place which feels comfort and safe. Sure. A few hundred feet from the junction, the road starts to seriously deteriorate to the point where you're not entirely sure if there's more road or more mud. It looks like it's been completely abandoned. And in places, the water from the sea actually laps up over the shore and has been slowly carving away at the edge of the road, which must take a long time. No one seems to pay much attention to it in the meantime. Ever present in front of you is the light, the beam coming from the lighthouse which has this weird illusion of just being over there and yet never seeming to move, no matter how much you move. It's an unoptical illusion, probably brought on in part by the thick fog, probably brought in on, in, in fact, by just its sheer size. As you start to come around, and you realize that it's not on the mainland. The lighthouse is, in fact, further out almost in the midst of the Keys itself. The tide has swollen uh, back, or pulled back rather from its full swollen uh, level, uh, revealing that there are a set of, of stones that are placed in front of it. Uh, what probably was an elevated road leading directly to the front of the lighthouse now has crumbled down to mostly just a walking path. The lighthouse itself stands several hundred meters tall, made of what appears to be gray brick or stone. At the very top is the brilliant light circulating around uh, everything, uh, making a rotation about once every 20 seconds or so. It's fairly fast. The base of the tower is squarish, where a sort of extended building was made out of 
uh, stone and a little bit of wood uh, around it. And then the tower itself just sort of extends upward from there. Around the uh, base of the tower, around the building, are a set of docks that have been built up and a set of ladders going from the ground level up to the docks. Judging from the way that they've greened and grayed, uh, the water probably reaches all the way to the high dock on the side of the building, such that if there was a rowboat or something like that, they could, in fact, float right directly and step right onto the dock. But when the water's low, like now, uh, you walk across the beach and the crushed stone and across these, these loose stones uh, up and probably moving up the ladder. And unfortunately, that's about 10 feet in the air. It's going to make it difficult to maneuver this particular box. <coughs> um, there's a, a door that faces on this side as well, right where the, the um, deck is. Well, I'm going to climb up the ladder and go knock on the door. Yeah, maybe they have equipment to bring packages like this up. Okay. You end up having to, to, uh, to stow the horse and, and kind of keep it back on the shore. Um, it's calm enough, even though it's somewhat riled by the storm. Annie's uh, attention has that. yeah, kept it a bit, bit calmer. Um, and kind of having to wade your way through. Pools of water still uh, lie around most of these rocks, where some of them have, uh, have uh, sunk in to the soft sand uh, by uh, nearby. So you're kind of having to pick your way across this, this uh, semi-flooded area to go and, and step onto the, the loose, uh, pebbly beach that surrounds the edge of this. And then you start climbing up the ladder. It's uh, an old ladder, but it seems like it was well made. It's slightly uh, slippery, um, as there is algae and a seaweed that's kind of grabbed onto it when it was most recently dunked in the high tide. You walk up to the door, give it a solid wrap. The door itself uh, seems to be of a very th solid, thick oak. You can see where on the deck itself and on the bottom part of the door, the water uh, at the highest of tides and, the, and, the, and the, uh, the most aggressive of tides has probably washed up over the deck on occasion, giving the bottom uh, third of the door uh, a kind of, uh, again, a greenish uh, uh, view uh, where uh, moss and other opportunistic uh, lichens have, have tried to attach themselves, but the water doesn't stay there long enough for them to really grow. The, the door thuds a couple of times, uh, and then the door uh, opens wide. Standing in front of you is a human man, probably... Uh, judging from the, the gray hair and the, 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 the long, uh, curled and knotted beard, maybe in his 70s? It's really hard to tell. He's hunched over slightly, uh, looks up at you with, with beady, uh, dark, and suspicious eyes. Um, who are you? Named Silas Marsh. We have a delivery for you from Aloysius. He's, don't remember his last name. Uh, right, anyways, I say his last name. I just don't remember it. <laughs> um, I literally just deleted that part from this particular file. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot his first full, like his full first name. I just call him Wish, so you can say like you're ordering stuff from Wish. Yeah, uh, Aloysius <laughs> Wyndham. Okay, ordering stuff from Wish. Oh my, I hadn't even thought of that. Um, he uh, his. His face goes through a, a, a complex set of emotions. When you introduce your name, uh, there is instant recognition and suspicion grows even deeper um, when you say Marsh. But when you mention that you have a package from Wish, um, you just sort of, uh, the, the, some of the edge of the glower wears off a little bit uh, and he just sort of nods. Well, you'd better get in here then or you get soaked. He kind of steps back from the door. I'll Come say on. from below the ladder, do you have a way to bring this up? It's pretty heavy. And he kind of looks back out beyond you. Why'd you come at low tide? That's just dumb. When is high tide? First time travelers? He uh, steps outside on, onto the deck, kind of looks down at you, looks up at the sky, looks out towards the, the sea. Won't be for a couple of hours yet. 
Hmm? We could wait for a couple of hours. Yeah, that's fine. We're already soaked and we can't get any more soaked. A woman's voice from inside calls out, Who is it, Angus? They're a couple of soaked rats is what they are. Ah, but you better put right on some here. tea. We can hear you. You'd better put on some tea. Oh, guests. And uh, kind of stepping out, there's a little bit of a of a of a of a roof extension here, um, and uh, now you know his name is Angus. Uh, kind of leans up against the wall, pulls out a pipe from an interior pocket, and starts stuffing the pipe. Well, you'd better all get inside then. I don't necessarily feel comfortable leaving this out here. Yeah. yeah. I'll stay with Blondie. You two go on in. Uh, Reach into my pocket for some sugar and realize, oh. You have a pocket full of, yeah, <laughs> pocket full of mushy sugar now. Actually, Gideon is currently in there trying to lap it up. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. <laughs> You're going to have a sugar high. Uh, flying snake in a second. That's going to be crazy. Yeah. Uh, what's the land around here like? Are there woods or? There are woods about uh, twenty feet back from a pebble beach, basically, which this is uh, this is standing on. The woods would offer a little bit of shelter as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna take uh, Blondie back towards the edge of the woods, and I'll. Uh, when I get to the edge, uh, as close as we can with the cart, I'll unhook her and take her into the edge of the woods and just keep an eye on the cart. The other two? What are you doing? Um, I'll tell Silas to um, let us know if, if anything happens. Uh, yeah, is there I a way we can sit like by a window? <laughs> there are no windows on the, on the lowest floor. Oh, I can make sure you guys know. Trust me. Okay. <laughs> um, and I will grab the small crate and go inside. Yeah. Okay. It's a little awkward climbing up the ladder with the crate, but it only takes you a little bit extra time. I'll just put it at the door. Okay. Like just inside the door, just so that it's not getting wet. The door is still open, and you can kind of smell a little bit of the of of of, um, or actually feel a little bit of heat coming from inside. Uh, Angus now has stuffed his pipe and just sort of watching all of you, not saying all that much. Um, takes him a moment or two to uh, to, to light it up. He's got some sort of, um, I guess, to our modern eyes, it would look like a lighter, but it's actually a, a flint and stone set in a in a uh, a wooden, um, or probably not wooden actually, but a, in a metal uh, handle which he uses to to light up his pipe. Uh, as you're coming towards the, you just sort of get up, you've kind of climbed up, you put the, the crate on top and are starting to climb up. Um, Want me to grab that? The crate? <laughs> oh, uh, I was just going to just put it inside the door so it doesn't get too much wetter. Okay. Yeah. As you're, you're climbing up and you kind of pop your head up above the, the, uh, the ladder, uh, somebody else comes to the door. It looks like a, uh, uh, an, I want to say middle-aged man. Um, wearing small round glasses, uh, he's holding on to a couple of uh, pieces of metal in his hands. He's got a broad face with a large chin, um, uh, a, uh, a curly brown hair uh, on the top of his head that kind of seems to, to dangle a bit in, into his glasses, and you can see him kind of half using the back of his hand, which he's probably done several times. As you can see, a small streak of of uh, uh, black oil, essentially, on the on the crease of his of his head, where he's probably adjusted his, his hair numerous times. Uh, but he's coming out and very excitedly turns to to Angus with this thing uh, in his hands. I think I've figured out a new mechanism. I, I I'm pretty sure that we can. Oh, hello. Who are you then? And uh, he kind of bundles over the, the machinery into one hand and then extends a hand out to Annie to give you a lift up. I don't know if you accept okay. it or not. It's a, it's a broad, strong hand, but you can feel the distinct uh, uh, bit of, of oil that still remains on his fingers where he didn't really think to wipe them off before giving you a lift up. Um, Angus, you didn't tell me we had guests. C come in, come in. And he kind We're of turns. 
he turns in and 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 uh, kind of calls in um uh Harriet, we've got guests. Bring out the better wooden bowls. And kind of wanders back in. Yes, often I'm guessing. Uh, uh, hmm? He turns back and throws over his shoulder. No, never, in fact. So come in, come in. Uh, kind of the opposite in in uh, in sentiment, if you will, from uh, Angus by the door, who kind of just sort of grunts as you go in and Sort of gestures with the pipe that to, to, for everybody to get in. Um, I get in. He sees that Silas has gone back with the horse, um, and he leans in towards the door and just sort of yells in, "Harriet, Harriet. get that no good boy of yours out here. Where is he anyway?" And you hear from inside as as Annie's kind of stepping through the door. You can see uh, the the squarish room that you're in is kind of a, a narrow room. Looks like uh, mostly storage uh, crates and barrels. Uh, there is a, a, a sort of a cloak ra rack off to one side with these heavy, uh, what look like fairly oily uh, um, jackets and hats and, and uh, uh, boots that seem to be uh, oiled, uh, oiled leather, probably meant to keep out water. You also see uh, a, a pile of ropes, and uh, beside the ropes you actually see the end where a, a, a grappling hook, uh, a small metal grappling hook, is actually attached to one end of the rope. Um, and in here, there's, there's, there's paddles, and there's um, what looks like a, a, even a small rowboat uh, kind of stuck inside for the moment. Um, looks like it's, it's uh, in the middle of being repaired. And that's just the entry room. And there's a further room in further, where, uh, in deeper, where you can see uh, a... Uh, a couple of kids sort of running around a, a young boy uh, and a somewhat older girl um, running around inside uh, chasing each other uh, uh, the the man who met you at the door moves over to the table and kind of sits down with his me mechanisms and you can see a woman uh, with uh, red hair um, sit, sitting at or working at the uh, fireplace that's off to your left uh, there's a fairly strong fire burning. Uh, you can feel, uh, smell a little bit of the smoke, but you can also smell uh, there literally is a stew that's being made, or probably has been being made for most of the day, uh, slow cooking over there. There's also the hint of something else, uh, and then you realize that they're steeping tea uh, in a pot that's sitting on the, on the table itself. And kind of usher you, and uh, Medrick, as you pass him by, Angus kind of looks you up and down, uh, and just sort of nods his head again, uh, almost approvingly. Um, mm -hmm. You get the impression that that he has some respect, maybe, for soldiers, and you still kind of have that same bearing. Um, I'll just do a slight nod back at him. <laughs> I'm uh, assuming that's like a greeting nod. Yeah, yeah, it seems to be. Um, and uh, make a make a insight check. I keep forgetting what my modifiers are. <laughs> and to like reopen my character sheet because they're on there. Oh. Yeah, unfortunately, there, there's a look that he gives you, but you, you aren't quite able to figure out what it means. It seems favorable, though. Okay. Um, I noticed if you're is... opening up your character sheet on roll 20, you can just click the thing and it'll roll. Yeah. <laughs> Because I keep accidentally closing my character sheet window. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> I am having a day. <laughs> okay, it's open again. There are too many windows. Absolutely. Um, the I'll maximize it too, so I don't have to scroll up and down. As you step in through the the initial threshold of the of the door, uh, again there's sort of the, again the fireplace off to your left. It looks like a series of doors to smaller rooms that line most of the right hand wall. You can see another pair of doors on the far end as well. But right to your right as you come in, there's an open space, and you can see a stairwell, that, uh, stair, stairwell not a stairwell, uh, that, uh, that seems to climb, cur climb in a curved way. And the round wall suggests that that's the, the roundish tower itself from the beginning, whereas this is a sort of extension that was built on to the base of it. Um, there's a large wooden table in the center of the room with several chairs. 
uh, at which now um, the uh, the man you met, uh, as well as the the woman you've heard, uh, are sitting. Uh, there's a big pot of ste- uh, tea that's steeping in the middle of the room as well. Um, you hear the woman uh, in response to what uh, Angus had said. Um, call out to the boy. Henry, go see what your grandfather wants. And you can see the young boy and the young girl both also have fairly brilliant red hair. Um, matching very much what presumably is their mother. Um, Henry kind of shrugs and sort of tromps by you. Um, kind of, he gives you, that, gives you that little kid stare as both as he passes by both of you. Kind of like wide-eyed, who are these people? Are people you know, these are people <laughs> I don't recognize. You get the impression that this child is probably, probably preteen, probably even a little younger than that. Whereas the girl is is uh, definitely a teenager, um, just in in general attitude. Um, all of them are wearing uh, sort of rough spun uh, uh, leather trousers for the most part. Um, some of them are cloth trousers. Uh, as well as uh, simple shirts um, that you get the impression have been washed so many times they've taken on that really soft character uh, and whatever pattern had been in the cloth the shirts were originally made from has faded now uh, to nothing more than a sort of shadow of its former self. Uh, but the girl kind of sits down uh, at the table. Actually, she walks over to the, to the uh, fireplace and kind of pokes away at the, the, the bubbling pot whereas the, ch- the younger child kind of steps out and steps outside. Um, you hear Angus uh, tell the boy, pointing with his, uh, his, uh, his pipe, um, you see him? You see him over there? Yes, yes I do. Go tend to the horse boy. And while you're there, pick a few apples. All right, and he goes back inside, pulls off pulls off one of the the hats that was sitting on the rack, a smaller cloak that he kind of double wraps around himself, and then tromps out uh, with a, a kind of enthusiasm, out towards the woods where uh, Silas and the horse are being uh, being uh, kept. Uh, the boy approaches Silas, uh, kind of, kind of, he's got that young boy gait, that sort of. Uh, I, I need to hit every puddle along the way. Uh, <laughs> yes, it's raining. Isn't this fun? Um, you know, he's got the exact opposite of what, but uh, again, a different opposite, if you will, of what Angus has. And he kind of walks towards you. Ooh, pretty horse. Oh. Hello, son. Her name's uh, Blondie. Hey, Blondie. And he kind of reaches up. He's a little short for the horse, but the horse kind of accommodates and, and leans down. I'm going to take over, take care of your horse, please. Does your horse like apples? Oh, yes. Excellent. There's, you a, have apple? there's a couple of trees just inside. I can climb them real good. And Grampy told me I could. <laughs> good. Um. My name's Henry. Hello, Henry. What are you? My name is Silas. Hello, Mr. Silas. And he reaches out and, and to shake your hand. I'll kind shake of, his hand. Kind of over-exaggeratedly uh, uh, polite, as Just if like... he's not really sure kind of how to do this. Uh, <laughs> well, how old is he? Uh, to your eyes, he looks to be about, about eight, maybe? Hmm. Well, let's go find these apples. I think they want to talk to you in the house. Usually they only get a chance to come out here when they want me to come out here and not be in the house when they're talking to people. <laughs> yeah, but I think... I look over at the, at the wagon and then back at Blondie, and I don't know if Blondie... Uh... I think Blondie wants me around right now. Really? You can talk to the horses? Let me try. And he walks up to the front of the horse. 
kind of reaches up and puts his hands on both sides of the mouth. Can you understand me? Understand is probably a big word for him, but do you know what I'm saying? And, and then he kind of... Kind of ears. You, you kind of oh, get the impression yeah. with that and with the encouragement of his hands, the head kind of shakes and nods. Do you like me? And again, kind of encouraging the head. I think he likes me. Is, is he, does he have to make an animal handling check? Or what? He has kid bonus. Okay. <laughs> he has the being cute. I see, Blondie's a lady. Oh. And he kind of looks down underneath the horse. Oh. I just learned about those. You can't tell on fish. We see mostly fish. And fish mm. people, they're a little easier to tell, but not much. I would imagine. It was impolite to stare, I guess. <laughs> but they were um. beautiful. They had scales, and they shimmered. And when the light caught them, it was like, wow, rainbows. <laughs> nice. I've never seen a fish person. Oh. Well... I see he might have, uh, but are, uh, he'll say he's never seen one. Yeah, there are Triton that would come on some of the ships, um, yeah. which are, are kind of mer people. Um, yeah, I'll go with him to pick the apples because I don't feel right leaving an eight year old kid out here for expecting possible banditry. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, he he quickly kind of goes off into the into the woods, uh, probably about uh, twenty feet into the woods, and there indeed yeah. are uh, what look like almost a hidden copse of apple trees. Um, that are at this particular point quite ripe. There's plenty of of, uh, of apples here. And he doesn't even really wait for you. He does look back to see if you're following every once in a while, but then kind of runs. And you're not really sure how this trick is accomplished because it almost looks like he runs straight up the side of the tree. It's probably just really, really used to climbing these particular trees. He knows where all the handholds are. He knows where this particular knot is, this particular place where he can grip with his knees, that he can just jump up with his hands. But he's very quickly up into the tree, even just before you arrive. Yeah, uh, I make sure to keep the cart and Blondie both in view. Uh, you can just make them out along, uh, along the edge of the forest. Enrys doesn't seem to be concerned at all. Mm-hmm. Um, That's why I'm here. Catch mm -hmm. Mr. Silas. And you look up and you see an apple flying towards you. Dexterity saving throw. Essentially. Mm. Nope. Uh, as you kind of uh, uh, jerk your head back to look upward, you hear this little squeal from uh, from the top of your hat. Uh, and then the apple, just about to hit you in the face, is intercepted by a uh, a flying uh, snake. Unfortunately, the apple is mm. a little bit heavier than the snake is, and both of them go go kind of sort of colliding into uh, your chest, just barely missing your chin. There's another little squeal from Gideon as uh, they sort of roll down your body and stretch out the wings just in time to. You can call it a graceful uh, uh, landing. If you're kind, mostly landing on the apple itself and greedily yeah. sort of tucking into it. He didn't completely kaplum. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that, yeah. Uh, sorry, mister. What is that you hear from the tree? That's Gideon. <gasps> Can I have one? <laughs> you can't have Gideon, but... Uh... If you can find someone who trains them, then uh, you might be able to get one from them. Did you train him? A little. Mostly just he... He likes eating grapes. That's mostly why he's here. But these are apples. Catch! He throws another one down. This time mm. you're prepared for it, and he, you get the impression that he's kind of used to slow grown-ups. And so when you didn't really catch the first one, he's uh, he's uh, kind of said catch and then waited till you're ready and then threw the apple. There's that little hesitation. 
Um, yeah, I think he just sees the the apples uh, and thinks they're big grapes. <laughs> I've never had a grape, so they're small apples. <laughs> um, smaller apples, but they taste like grape. <laughs> Not really, but. He sees a he sees a small round thing and tries to eat it. He occasionally does that with small rocks. <laughs> but that's not good, is it, Gideon? And he gets a little stroke near his ears. There's sort of a little hiss as Gideon's a little protective over the apple that it's it's proceeding to both eat and bore into at the same time. Um, but then realizing it's you, it kind of leans into it. Uh, after a, a few minutes, uh, Henry has, has gathered about a dozen apples. Uh, one by one kind of tossed down to you. You get the feeling that he probably didn't need to toss them down to you, especially when he climbs down the tree and pulls out a, a burlap bag from a, a, a pocket in the jacket or pocket mm -hmm. in the cloak. <laughs> and he kind of carefully piles in the, in the apples, uh, keeping one for himself and kind of wiping it off on his shirt, which you're not really convinced makes it any cleaner, but it seems like more of that was he was told that was a thing to do, uh, and then takes a big, mm -hmm. a big bite out of them. They look like what well, we, we would see the equivalent of Macintosh apples. They're, they're kind of gray, or sorry, green and red apples. They're a semi-sweet apple, a little smaller probably than, than fist-sized. Uh, before he bites into the apple, I'll press to digitate it to clean it. Yeah. <laughs> He's sort of like halfway to, little... the, to the mouth, uh, and kind of takes a takes a bite out of it. But as the effect is kind of looking, his eyes just go wide, and he kind of finishes the bite, chews, and looks at the apple. What was that? What, what did you do to the apple? That was magic. I cleaned it. Wow. Yeah, it's kind of cool. You can do magic, and you have a pet flying snake. <laughs> Those things are usually mutually exclusive. You're going to have another small child following you around. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you grow up, maybe you'll have magic and a pet flying snake too. And a horse. There's a there's a momentary look of, of, of excitement, and then it kind of falls heavily. Yeah, that's such a long ways away. And I think I have to work the lighthouse next. Well, once you're old enough, then maybe you can leave the lighthouse. Why would I leave the lighthouse? Well, you might have to leave the lighthouse if you want to learn magic. No. That's not fair. And he kind of uh, he continues to eat the apple and kind of kick the ground as, it goes, as he leads you back out to your horse. Um, he takes another apple from the bag and, and proceeds to, to feed Blondie with it. Uh, who now is instant best friend. Mm -hmm. uh, the way to a horse's heart is clearly uh, through its its stomach. And he holds out the bag of apples to you. Here you go. Take them back to the tower. I think mom wants to make a pie. Oh, yeah. Sure. I'll be right back. Uh, I'll take them back to the tower and knock on the door. Okay. Angus is still sitting outside. Just kind of oh, okay. Uh, I was told to bring these over. Mm-hmm. Take them inside. Can Angus see the horse and the yep. cart from here? Yeah, okay. Kind of thinking about, it, thinking about it, that where he has been standing has been watching over them this entire time. But he's not going to tell his grandson that, clearly. Yeah, well, I'm more concerned with uh, us, but uh, and the crate. Um, the can't just like lift the crate easily. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'll go in then. Okay. Uh, in the meantime, um, the uh, folks inside have introduced themselves to uh, to Annie and Medrick. The woman who's been stirring things uh, introduced herself as uh, Harriet. I'm, my name is Harriet. That's my husband, uh, Jonas. And Jonas is the one who, with the glasses, um, 
has been tinkering away at what looks like some sort of metal gears, um, kind of angling them, kind of taking them apart, reassembling them, running his fingers along the edges of the, the, the gears where this sort of thick, uh, oily, greasy substance is there. At one point, uh, Harriet uh, snaps her, her uh, towel at him and shoes him away from doing that at the dinner table. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he, uh, he kind of uh, grins uh, and, and apologizes and then heads up the stairwell. Um, you met uh, Henry already, the younger boy. Uh, the girl is introduced as Esther. And she seems kind of, kind of quiet. She picks up a book and starts reading in the corner. Um, just kind of taking it all in, trying, uh, trying to, to understand who these people are. Uh, Annie, make an insight check. Two. Okay. Um, every once in a while, she glances in your direction, but quickly looks back down at the book. She has long, uh, almost brilliantly uh, red hair, um, kind of like her mother. Hers, though, is, is tied up, actually not entirely unlike what, uh, what Marie's hair is like today, uh, with a sort of side braid that runs mm-hmm. down, but it's a lot longer than, than uh, Marie's hair. Um, her mother, Harriet, uh, her hair is tied uh, in a bun in the back of her head. Uh, but uh, And while there's some age there, it still has a very strong red color. Uh, Henry's hair is very short um, to the point where uh, it looks like he probably gets it cut on a daily basis, uh, or at least it feels like that. Um, but they welcome you in. Um, Harriet has put indeed put some tea in and, and uh, pours a doesn't actually ask, but pours a cup for each of you. Um, almost as though like you know, why would you refuse hot tea in a cold day, kind of thing. Yeah, basically. Um, suggest that you hang your uh, your cloaks and your outdoor clothing by the fire for them to dry off. Uh, it has a sort of uh, semi complicated wooden tree um and which she she uh uh kind of fusses at for a second uh jonas comes back down the stairs uh and uh and comes over oh let me do that dear and kind of comes over and it it seems to be this sort of semi-mechanical structure that he finds a particular point and starts cranking a tiny little crank and the whole thing goes from from a narrow little almost evergreen tree shape to kind of folding out like an umbrella and there's a sort of clicking time clicking moment where it stops and clicks Uh, and then he winds another little wheel towards the bottom and the whole thing starts to rotate slightly in front of the fire Um, it's one of mine I've been working on little things like that it's good to keep busy I've never seen anything like that nope neither have I I still don't know what, call, what to call it, though. Hmm. Interesting. Silas comes Silas. back with a bag full of apples. Sees the scene as well in front. Cool. Uh, Harry comes Harry. over and takes the bag of apples from, from uh, you and then hands them Harry. to Esther. Uh, would you peel these, please, dear? And there's a sort of exasperated sigh and snort as she <laughs> proceeds to go to the other end of the table and get some water out and get a knife out and start to peel the apples because it's clearly the most difficult thing that needs to be done. And sure, it's her burden for the day because that's the only thing she has to do today. It's not like she has been finally trying to finish the, her reading or trying to relax a little bit or trying not to be, you know, covered in food for the day. You know, there's there's a lot conveyed in that How sense. How does Esther seem? Esther's clearly a teenager. <laughs> clearly what? Clearly a teenager. Ah. And you get the impression that it's sort of, while there is some genuine kind of um, annoyance there. It's the yes, mom. Kind of, yeah, but also there's other people who see the performance there, so it might be a little bit bigger than it has normally been. 
so the thing that Jonas was working on, it's like, it's been, he said it was, it looked kind of like a tree it had branches and there was like a, wow. Like some kind of like cloth extending with it. Or it's, but, is it basically an umbrella? It, it would be the combination of an umbrella, a hall tree, uh, and a, uh, a sort of slowly rotating base. So it, it folds up into a small pole. Coat on and it rotates so that one coat isn't the one closest to the fire. Right, right, exactly. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of an adaptation in some ways of a, a rotating spit, but combined with a, 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 a hull tree, which is where you put all your, your clothes on, but then done so that you can actually keep them all getting a chance to get some part of the fire. And it seems to be the, the motor in the bottom, there's probably a spring or something that he's wound up, as well as the other, the other gears necessary to kind of fold things outward. Okay. So you'll stay for supper then. I'll have some fresh pie. Pie. It sounds delicious. Yeah. Um, We're just waiting for the tide to come in so we can finish our delivery. Um, Jonas pipes up. Oh, that's why you're here. Oh, excited. I wasn't sure exactly if the, the blacksmith could pull it off. It was a rather complicated design and it had a whole bunch of other moving parts. And I couldn't really be there to actually oversee all parts of the making of it. So I was hoping my drawings were clear enough for him. I mean, don't get me wrong, he has a great reputation. But this, this is a little bit more complicated than we've done in the past. It's too complicated, you hear from the door. <laughs> what is it for? Well, how do I describe it? Um, so, the lighthouse has a mechanism which uses to spin and turn and, and, and light things up. And that's been a successful and hard-working mechanism for a long, long, long time. But it's starting to show some very severe wear. Now, my idea was to take the very core of it and use it to power itself. Interesting. I think so. Probably not. If some people are to be believed. And he kind of glances towards the outer door where Angus is still hanging out outside. It's not traditional. And he kind of glances at that point at his wife, at the, at the, uh, the food. But, but uh, if there's any reason that my wife married me, it's because I'm not traditional. <laughs> uh, and she kind of smiles well, that's not the only reason dear but it helps I can take you to show you if you'd like I mean we can install the, the actual new mechanism later but would you like to go up the tower sure uh, is anybody watching the wagon and the crate I believe Angus is okay because uh and have you guys noticed any uh, increased bandit activity? Because on the roads, there was a destroyed wagon. Um, Harriet looks a little bit disturbed by that, as does Jonas. Uh, Esther looks interested. Like, this is the most interesting thing you could have said at this particular moment, because something has happened. Um, we've heard, uh, Harriet speaks, we've heard a little bit. We don't, there's not a lot of people that come out this way. But uh, when, well, it happens, I suppose. Um, Jonas kind of nods. Well, when, when I made the order with uh, the blacksmith, he, he did say that he would have to send some people with it. I, I guess that's you. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I guess he was right. Uh, sad to hear something about a, you said a wagon was burned? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the rider was killed. It was terrible. You know, it's the second time we encounter this situation while traveling. <laughs> oh, well, you must all be really bad luck. Uh, Jonas kind of 
nervously laughs. I, I, I mean, not that you're actually bad luck. I, I just mean that you have. Do you want to see the tower? Yeah. And no worries. Uh, I, I use twisted humor also. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll, like, laugh as a, at his, like, bad, bad luck joke. Okay. Um, he he seems more worried than anything else, I think. Um, he leads the three of you up. Um, clearly, Harriet and Esther have seen this more than once, and Angus is still sitting outside, and Henry's over by the, the horse still, uh, having a ball. Um, you're not really sure what games he's invented, Silas, but you're sure he's got at least ten games invented by just glancing out the door. Um, mm. but, but Jonas leads you uh, up the tower, and they're fairly broad, uh, large stairs. Uh, and you quickly come to realize that the interior of the tower itself is nothing but stairs. There are no floors. Uh, it is it is simply a spiral staircase turning upward towards the upper level. There are small windows, um, but they are really not not much more than narrow slits that are car that are that were as part of the building, uh, part of the design of the building, uh, built up uh, with a a a thick glass or crystal so they let a little bit of light in but you can't really see much distinctly out through them and even with that um, Jonas has grabbed a a, uh, a um, lantern that he's had lit and is walking up the tower uh, because even despite the fact that it is full day uh, but dis uh, but because of the the overcast and because of the limit in here it's, it's still quite dim he walks sure-footedly though and you get the impression that he's made this trek probably every day, if not several times a day, for years. Um, the rest of you find it a little bit tiring, uh, because it is a spiral staircase that goes up a couple of hundred feet. Uh, finally, the staircase ends in an open hatchway uh, to a wooden flat floor. Uh, as you come in on that floor, uh, first of all, you can kind of hear the the churning of, of, of metal uh, teeth and, or sorry wooden uh, yeah metal teeth uh, turning in in conjunction with others different cogs and things that are twisting um, there's also every few seconds a little a little tri trio of released gas or steam or something you're not quite sure what it is up above you, though, even through the hatchway, you can see the, the brilliant light which sort of sweeps over the edge of the hatchway and then uh, moves on. And when you step up towards this level, um, you see uh, a circular wide uh, flat floor uh, with, uh, uh, in the center, a thick pillar made of what looks like metal. Uh, turning uh, turning around at the very top of that metal uh, pillar is the actual light itself um, which Jonas does warn you pretty quickly oh uh, when it comes to your direction don't look directly at it it will hurt your eyes and it it's really smarts and he kind of adjusts his I'll, I'll, I'll just like yeah he adjusts yeah, his does. glasses kind of nervously and you kind of wonder if the reason he has glasses is he made that mistake um, I'm going to tip my hat down when the light washes over you... Close my eyes whenever it comes my way. <laughs> when the light washes over you, there is the brilliance of it to begin with. But there's almost a force. It's almost as though you feel a, a, a bit of a push when it hits you uh, as well. And there's a bit more warmth than you might have expected. That might be just the proximity to such a bright light, or it might be something else. Um, Medric, make a religion roll. All right. I actually have the character sheet open now. Something about this very quickly starts to remind you of the Everflame Towers that are the center of every Temple of Ignis, um, where there is the, the massive ever-burning flame which is there. It doesn't have any of these mechanisms. It doesn't have any uh, particular beams that it gives out. But there is that sense of warmth and that sense of familiarity that strikes you as the as the light passes over you. Cool. 
Um, at the very top, you can see that there is a, a, a dome of, again, that sort of thick glass, but this time mostly uh, gray as other things have been introduced into the glass or something to shield it so that the direction of the light comes out only one side or two sides of this, uh, of this lantern. Inside the room, there are three large barrels, each of which have a small tap, which seems to be turned slightly like a spigot, and uh, a small amount of liquid is pouring out of each of the three of them. Um, it looks like one of the liquids is clear like water. One of them seems to be thick like, uh, like uh, um, oil. Uh, and the third one seems to be kind of amber uh, in color. Um, and Jonas uh, takes you up. Uh, on the sides of the walls, uh, there are massive, large, very clear crystal... Uh, windows uh, in, in almost all the spaces. Anywhere the beam would actually interact with seems to be crystal, uh, but there are actual stones on the side to try to maintain some structure. Uh, the top of the room is a dome, and you can see that there are... Um, uh, there's a, the, the top of the pillar actually extends beyond the top of the dome, uh, and there's a, a, a sort of wooden flat roof uh, on the top of the dome as well, through which this, this pillar turns. Um, and there's a sort of a, 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 a wheel on the inside, which would be kind of the equivalent of a washer, essentially, uh, allowing it to spin without actually uh, coming in contact, possibly also keeping a seal. Uh, Jonas kind of walks around and, and starts to check the, the spigots of each one. Uh, here it is, the lighthouse center. What's, what what's in there? I'll point to the big bright light. Well, the name is a little bit lost in time. Uh, this lighthouse has been in operating for, I think, hundreds of years at this point. And while it's always been in the Frey family, uh, from what I understand, uh, I'm, I'm a Cromley myself. But from what my wife has told me, because her father won't, uh, there was a discovery made at sea. Uh, a, a bright light, uh, as the story goes, uh, fell from the sky one day and struck a boat. It could have missed and, and landed in the water. There was plenty of water around, but it struck this boat, nearly capsizing it. Uh, the very center of that uh, was a, a stone, and the stone gave off a brilliant fire. Uh, and that fire they were able to tame over, I guess, more generations and figure out its secrets. I haven't learned all of them myself. Angus is usually the one still to maintain this. And sometimes Henry as well. Well, the, the power that's contained in that is, well, I, I suppose you would say dangerous. If you were to see the light directly or, and not be filtered by the glass that's around it, uh, well, I, I don't know exactly what would happen. Um, Harriet has never seen it, uh, and Angus won't talk about it. But there was a crack once in the glass, and the, the mechanism itself is starting to wear down a little bit after centuries of use, uh, despite the fact that the Frey family has taken care of it very well. But the crack in the glass caused all sorts of things to appear on the water. Um, things like illusions? Silas knows about those. Do you? Well, I make an illusionary otter float through the air. Remarkable. Uh, I, I don't have any skills in, in those sorts of things. I know materials, and I know gadgets, and I know wheels and cogs and, and cranks and that sort of thing. Um, magic has always seemed a little bit too beyond me. But no, uh, I don't know if they were illusions or not. Uh, it was about a decade ago now. Um, yeah, because Henry hadn't been born yet, and Esther was still a child. But creatures started to appear in the water large creatures. They, they had long, tube-like, boneless arms, or, or, or maybe they were uh, like vines. 
Like we... tentacles? Maybe. Uh, yes, I, I suppose that would be what they would be, but they were enormous. They were, they were the size, in the smallest cases, of the largest mast I've ever seen on a ship. Uh, it was... Well, they, they, they attacked the ships that were at sea that day. I know that at least one went down. That's why I'm not so sure it was an illusion. But instead, somehow had... I don't know. I have theories, but I don't really understand magic all that much. Oh, there's a ship now. And he points out towards the, the sea. Uh, pulls, uh, goes over to the, the side and, and picks up a uh, spyglass. Oh, yeah. That one's been back before. And he hands the spyglass. Whoever wants to take a look. I'll take a look. Okay. I'll take a look after Annie, and uh, I'll ask, how, how is the crack in the glass fixed? Well, uh, another thing that I'm fairly familiar with is at least the properties of, of certain chemical agents. Um, there was a, uh, uh, an alchemist in town who was very skilled. You may have met him. I have to look up his name. Uh, where did it go? Uh, Dr. Marigold. Dr. what? Dr. Marigold. A delightful fellow. A halfling. Um, I believe trained in Pitajun. I, I suppose he wanted to see the sea, the sea which Pitajun is in, ground, in land. I, I grew up there. I can understand. <laughs> if anyone, I can understand the wanderlust of wanting to see the sea. But... Uh, he had a concoction that he created um, that he used on the crystal itself. Well, actually, I, I actually put it on the crystal. But it seemed to heal the crystal enough uh, to its present time. Since then, we've been on the, on the lookout for other things we can use to contain it. Like You're going to have to repeat that. There's a lot of vehicle outside. <laughs> yeah. When using... There's a boat out there. Can you hear its engine? Wait. No. Uh, and you hoist the... Uh, the the uh, spyglass up and it takes you a few minutes to kind of find uh, the sort of dark brown on dark blue on dark gray scene in front of you that try to pick out the ship looks like the waves have kicked up a little bit uh, looks to be a, uh, a, a uh, three masted ship uh, looks like it's, it's sailing uh, you can see kind of heavily in the water it's probably laden down it does seem to be coming in the general direction of the bay uh, you can see them uh, working on board to to uh, lash everything down. The water keeps rolling up over the edges of the of this of the boat. In your travels, you've only had one day, which would be equivalent of this bad of weather, and it was kind of terrifying. Um, the only comfort that you kind of took in it was the the uh, the steady orders being given by the captain and bosun that kept everybody busy and kept everybody uh, on track. Uh, as you're kind of moving and trying to kind of keep with it, the spyglass, you kind of have to keep moving up and down to follow the stupid bikes, uh, to follow the, uh, the motion of the, the ship on the ocean. Uh, you do catch sight of its flag, which seems to be, uh, stark white on a, uh, a blue background. Uh, and it, it's kind of flapping and moving indistinctly. Uh, but it, it seems to have, at that moment, a strangely familiar shape. It's inverted from the way you saw it the last time. But in the dream, there was this shadowy figure of a woman waving a handkerchief out to sea while, while extending a hand back that was clasped in another hand of a figure you could not see. That's the flag. Meanwhile, inside. That flag. Huh? I'll, I'll, point, uh, I'll give the spyglass to, to Medrick and mention that flag looks familiar. Takes you a few minutes to kind of uh, zone in on the, the ship itself. In fact, a large wave kind of obscures the ship entirely. And you kind of, for the moment, your heart skips. Did it just go under? But no, it seems to ride the swell up on the other side. Uh, it's, it's pitching back and forth pretty badly. But uh, uh, 
finally you're able to trace back up to the top of the, the tallest mast. And indeed, uh, as I described, that, that flag has a very familiar look about it. And do I recognize it immediately almost? Or? Well, the fact that, that Annie brought it to your attention and it has, it, while it's flapping wildly in the wind, um, you're kind of able to, to just tune the, the spyglass just a little bit more to get him a little more clarity. And for a second or two, you see that same image. It's almost as though when it moves through your sight, uh, it, it kind of hovers at one moment. That sort of motion of a wave that causes a ship to seem like it hovers in midair for a brief second. And clear as day, the image of the flag is shown to you and then quickly fades away. I'm like, what? And I'll actually, no, I, I won't put this spyglass down right away. Like in the vision, she was holding the hand of something. So I kind of like look around the ship. Is there something else there? It, it looks though, it looks as though people are just busy trying to lash everything down to move the sails as necessary to hold on. Um, uh, as you watch, you do see that the, the water washes over the edge of the ship. And you weren't really paying that close of attention, but you think someone just got washed overboard. Yeah, that's not good. Meanwhile, I'll Jonas is... Spyglass to Silas. Sure, right. I'll we'll let him know that forward. the flag on the mast is an upside-down version of the flag from one of the visions. Weird. Uh, mm, it's upside-down. That's a bad omen. So the flag isn't upside-down. Well, it's no. A, it's if it's upside-down from what we saw, that's a bad omen. But it's not. Uh, maybe I mistakenly described it, but it is not. It seems to be the same. It's the opposite. Same orientation. It just it's it's pointing out to sea, or it seems to be pointing out to sea. Okay. Um, that also could the be the flag fact that out to sea? the the woman on the flag is pointing out to sea. Uh, oh, oh, there's a woman on the flag. Okay. <laughs> I thought the flag was the the like the handkerchief. Right? That's what I thought. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So the okay. So the flag is a woman holding a handkerchief with a white out, out to sea, and then with a hand extending backward as well, holding onto something you cannot see. Okay. But the orientation you quickly realize is probably just because the flag is blowing in the breeze, so it could be flowing this way, and then it could be floating the other way, uh, very quickly. Okay. Mm. I never From get tired of looking out to sea. It's quite amazing the power that it has out there. And all the more important for to make sure that this thing keeps going. Uh, I think I just saw somebody get washed overboard. Oh no! That's I hope oh, really? you didn't know anybody. I'll take a look around. Uh, seeing this again is a good omen. <laughs> We're on the right track. Unfortunately, I'm just thinking back to training I've had previously. Have I ever stared directly into the Everflame? Absolutely. It would be something they do to make all initiates go through and some initiates don't get much further than that. Alright. So clearly I passed that test. Um, actually, I won't do it right now. But at some point while we're here, I want to try like just briefly looking into the light, see what happens. <laughs> okay. But right now, I'm, I'm more more like focused on the ship, and if I do that right now and things go south, then it's like, uh, I can't see the ship anymore. That would be a problem, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yes, do I see anything? Uh, unfortunately, at this point, the waves are getting uh, very, very choppy, and you can still make out the ship just barely, but uh, it's getting more and more increasingly obscured by waves. It is moving slowly in towards the bay, and the, the, while the waves are high at the bay, they do tend to be a little less uh, uh, severe uh, and a little less choppy. This storm is taking a significant, uh, or the ship rather, is taking a significant beating in this particular storm. So we'll, uh, how far away is the ship? It still hasn't entered the bay, so it's still a couple of miles from shore. Yeah, there's nothing we can do about that. Um the light seems rather powerful. 
How come nobody's tried to steal this? Do they just not know it exists? Oh, well, I mean, I, there are tales. Uh, Angus doesn't say all that much about them, but there are tales about how there have been some attempts at the tower before, uh, but it hasn't happened for a long time. I think that people just know that it's important for the ships at sea. Make an insight check. Right. Window. Ta -da. Eh, could be better. Oh, well. Um, yeah, he, he looks a little bit nervous at the suggestion and kind of moves beyond it. He, he starts talking about the mechanism itself and how, you know, the, one of the improvements he's managed to, to add is a second gear to make these things a little bit easier. Um, the reason the three barrels are there is that they combine different liquids together to help, uh, keep the, the central shaft moving carefully and kind of gets lost in details and almost overwhelmingly with details, uh, at a certain point. As he's going on, like, the moment he starts talking about anything scientific, it's like, whoop, in one ear, out the other. <laughs> so I'll take that time, because if that ship is not coming in for a while, I'll just briefly, like, look down mostly, but, like, just give a little glance into the light. Okay. So you're going to deliberately stare into the light. Yep. Uh, constitution saving throw, please. What? Constitution Go saving on. throw, please. Wrong window. Okay. As you kind of glance up and prepare yourself for the light to pass over you. Again, it has had a familiar feeling to you, but not quite the same. Um, you feel the, the light sort of creep across your face and then start to enter your, uh, your right eye. And everything goes brilliantly white as it passes into your eye. Um, you feel lifted. You feel energized. And as it passes over to the other eye, again, everything goes white. And you feel the energy flow into you. It is not dissimilar to the way that Ignis's energy will erupt from you, but this is something outside. There can be no doubt in your mind at this point that somehow this is a manifestation of Ignis's energy. But then there's the second wave when the familiarity kind of passes through you and then it starts to hurt. And then you realize this is not the passive um, consumption that can happen from Ignis's fire. This is not the energy which is there to invigorate and will motivate. This is the anger. This is the energy that, as a Kmar, you have been told you will channel. Cool. But it hurts. It hurts a lot. And as the light passes oh, over your eyes, you find yourself blinded. Uh-oh. Casually looking over, you'll notice that Medric's eyes have gone completely fire. They appear to be small flames licking up around his eyes, but he also seems to be unaware of his space around him. Uh, you hear Jonas gasp. No, 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 is no, no, no. Any, is there any water nearby? Like pails or anything? Uh, well, there's the giant barrels which have a spigot which seem to be uh, uh, pouring water into the trough that's at the base of this. I'll raise one hand up. Okay, I I'll raise one hand up and say, like, Here's don't worry, I've done this before. I spray it at, at uh, actually, I try, to, I try to carry it over and splash it into uh, Medrick's face. Okay. So, like, probably, it, I probably shouldn't be on fire like that. So, Jonas sees it, says, like, oh, no, no, no. At that time, I will say, don't worry, I've done this before. <laughs> and I kind, of imagine, I kind of imagine that, Silas, you, you, you would use your hat, because it is a waterproof yeah. hat. And gather a little bit of the water. But I'm wondering if I then... say that right away, is it enough to prevent Silas from splashing me with water? <laughs> oh no, no. Uh, as you nope. as as you feel the the moment of of 
serenity and power and strength and you in the calm calm i've done this but as the water splashes over your face and uh is it still there it causes you to kind of blink unint unintentionally and uh you do see that the flames have faded everything around you seems to be illuminated uh for the next eight hours uh now that you're no longer blinded you have dark vision extended to 120 feet as literally the world seems illuminated to you damn it silas what why did you do that your face was on fire yeah and but not he was normal on way. fire all the time when he cast spells so. yeah but he wasn't casting a spell is is, is he all right are you all right what what yes. happened uh I told you not when to look the, at the thing. Yes, but uh, I'll explain. When the light washed over me earlier, it had a resemblance to the flame of Ignis. Are you familiar with Ignis? Yes. Would you like to hear the word of Ignis? No. <laughs> <laughs> Here, have a pamphlet. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I normally, there are some thick goggles that I have that I can wear. Uh, they were made by a, a, a dwarven uh, smith uh, in Pitajun, and I can use those to work on the, 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 the center core when I need to, but I... I are you all... He kind of walks closer to you. You can all kind of see that even though his eyes are no longer on fire, there's sort of the, the coal burns, if you will, underneath and around the eyes, kind of giving this, this almost uh, uh, eye shadow effect Dark almost, <laughs> as, the, as the eyes themselves are kind of glowing somewhat. Um, nice. It was similar to the flame of Ignis when I first felt it upon me, and the acolytes of Ignis, or the followers of Ignis are no strangers to touching warm things or staring into lights. For example, staring into the Everflame, and this light, this beacon, has a strong resemblance to the Everflame, so I looked into it to see what would happen. Wow, that's... And sure enough, it is of Ignis. That's either really dumb or extremely faithful. And he's got his back to the light, a bit of both. kind of purposely not even looking in that direction at this point. But there was pain, but there was also energy. And believe it or not, I can actually see better right now in dark areas. That's... Mm. In other words, I'll probably do, do this again. And he holds his hand out in front of him and kind of catches the light as it passes. Ah. Huh. It, it, it's dimmer than it was. And he kind of goes over to a, a work table where there's some piled things and he kind of digs through and pulls out something with uh, four crystals that are all on different uh, rotatable uh, arms, but they're all attached to this sort of central place so they can be aligned or they can be separated. And he pulls it out and kind of holds it into the light beam as it passes. And the light beam splits in four different pieces and then recombines in the center. He kind of adjusts it. He kind of walks around the room with it to keep it in the beam of light. It's a little bit dimmer. Uh, I don't know what you did to it, but it's a little bit... Uh, I think it'll still reach them out there, but that was uh, unexpected. As far as I know, I did nothing. Uh, we can check back tomorrow to see if it regains its former brightness. I, I think... I think that you... Uh, that part of its light became part of you. Uh, hopefully it's only temporary because they're going to need this light, but I'm kind of surprised, to say the least. Do you mind if I take a closer look at you? Oh, go for it. And uh, he starts pulling out other instruments, uh, mostly Just based on crystal. Sharp objects into my eyes, please. Puts one down. <laughs> And uh, starts to kind of closely examine and uses that same sort of thing, but kind of holds it uh, awkwardly towards your face. It's it's probably about a foot long normally. And he's kind of, and with the, the four branches, each at different lengths, uh, you can kind of imagine it almost like a planetary display, right? Where you have the crystals at different lengths and you can kind of adjust them. And he's holding the, the, the furthest one out to right, almost touching your eye and then trying to adjust the others. And Silas and Annie, uh, more so than Medric, because it's almost too close to Medric to see, 
but you can see that a small amount of light is being captured by the larger crystal coming out of Medrick's eye and sort of rearranging. And with that, he's sort of calibrating the device to, to figure out exactly how much. It's, 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 it's enough to notice. It's about a, I don't know, if I had to guess, uh, one one thousandth of the whole power, but in brightness, but not in effect. It's dimmer than one one thousand. It's, uh, it's probably about, uh, I don't know, it does some math. It kind of rolls out his fingers. It's at about 75% of its capacity, I think. Three quarters, yeah. The but, beacon? Right. Whoa. But the other quarter is not all on your eyes. I, I don't know what happened to it. Maybe in the giving. Maybe in the giving it needs to give more to give... I don't know. It's going to be needed to be studied. Um... The only thing I would is like to more about this. I'll definitely mention it to the flamekeeper. Do you ever go to Elf Butter by any chance? Oh, very rarely. Um, we okay. go to get supplies about once a month. Um, sometimes we have them delivered. Uh, we make arrangements ahead of time. This needs a little bit of maintenance all the time. And and while my wife is is technically the the next fray in line, um, I've kind of picked up a lot of those duties. Uh, and she's kind of let me tinker with it uh, when Angus isn't insisting on it himself. Well, the next time you visit Elvire for supplies or anything, stop by the Temple of Ignis, and you'll notice the Everflame on that temple is quite similar. I never made the Maybe. connection before. Hmm? Well, I never what made that the connection before. I should have thought of that. Huh. Yeah. Um... But, uh... Maybe I don't stare into it just yet, but... <laughs> well, m maybe... Uh... Oh, I see. You have his, the, the symbol of Ignis upon you. Okay. Yeah, I'll show uh, him the amulet. This, this'll this work. Um, maybe we don't tell Angus what you did. Uh, maybe you were demonstrating, showing me some of the power of Ignis, and we were comparing notes, and nothing changed in the light. I'm okay with this. And he looks kind of pleadingly towards you all. Um, can I make an insight check to, like, is this believable? <laughs> it's more of a deception if it's not, check. Actually. Can help us make a better lie. It's, it's more of a deception check to see if you 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 know if it, if it's a sufficient lie or can make a better one. Nope. Sounds good to you. That means sounds believable, I guess. And he kind of looks towards Silas for a bit of confirmation. Um. Sure. I mean, I'm not here to be in your business whatever you want to tell him is fine okay um what do you think he would do if he knew the full story well i uh, he sometimes locks me out of the tower hmm when and if anything go wrong there would be a bad time well it's also really wet outside mm -hmm. he and I don't always see eye to eye on, on, on the different things that I'm trying to do to help make things better uh, he's very much a traditionalist and, and believes that Tradition is the only way this has been maintained. And, and, and to be fair, the Frey family has maintained this lighthouse for hundreds of years, so uh, technically he's right. But I know that we can do much, so much more. The windmill up above, which helps to turn this, is not always reliable, although the winds are fairly strong here and, and tend not to stop blowing for some reason. But if I can recapture some of the energy that's 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 used, then I know that I can make this a, a self self-satisfying device. That's the thing that I had the blacksmith work up. It's a, it's a cage of sorts that will go over the dome, 
and if I've done my calculations right, it will be able to capture uh, even less energy, less fire, less light than, than you did, Mr. Medrick, but uh, it can then be used to turn itself. Also, well, capture the energy from the stone, no. of course. Okay. Wow! Well, did I not tell you about the stone? Uh, the, I told you about the the flame that fell from the sky. Well, at the center of that was a stone, and a small part of that stone is there. Oh, okay. What's what happened to the rest of the stone? I think they broke it up and and used it for different things. There's a a, a guild, I guess, in Pitajum which knows more about them. Every decade or so, I think they come and inspect the different lighthouses that are powered like this. In fact, they're due, I think, to come fairly soon. I wonder what they'll think of my new designs. <laughs> I'm sure they'll be uh, pleased. Well, I hope it works. I do, too. I dearly do love Harriet, and I hate to have to take a job in town. Speaking of which, I'm sure that she's managed to... Uh, fill the room uh, with food by now. So if you'll join me downstairs, we'll have a, a, yeah. a bit of a meal. Sure. Uh, Silas makes sure to stay out of the beam as much as possible. Okay. And you notice, too, as you kind of... I'm tempted to look into it again, but it won't. <laughs> the, the way this is angled, um, and you also notice the sort of thickness of glass... The, the glass on the side, which would actually face the land, uh, is thicker and with more stone. And so a much less light actually makes it out that side. Um, and as you kind of look out, you can actually see uh, uh, Henry uh, by the edge of the woods. Uh, and there's, there is a little bit of light that passes over him, which you didn't really notice from the angle you were at before. But it's so much slimmer than light that, that's here. Um, and otherwise, it's almost all on the wagon, right? What's that? Nobody else around the wagon? No bandits or anything? Nope. Okay. I mean, Henry might steal your wagon and horse, but, you know, other than... <laughs> uh, Josh, uh, Jonas, rather, leads you back down, down downstairs, and indeed, uh, there is now uh, sort of baking away a pie uh, on a grate uh, in the fireplace. Uh, you can smell the apple and cinnamon uh, mixing together. Uh, but uh, otherwise, uh, food is served. Angus actually, uh, uh, well, actually, uh, Harriet comes out to Angus with a wooden bowl of food. Uh, and uh, you see him leave the front door. And he walks down the, or goes down the ladder, walks out towards Henry, brings the food to him. So now the two of them are actually out there. Uh, and then Esther's kind of watching oh, over no. the rest of you. Yep. Hmm? Uh, Esther, the the uh, the teenage daughter, is kind of looking back and forth at all of you. And what are you reading? It seemed interesting. Oh, oh, it is. Um, it's a historical book. You can make an insight check. Yep. It's a history book of some kind. Interesting. It's from a place very far away and tells the history of a kingdom. A very I old see. kingdom. Uh, the, the kings and queens of Icro. Maybe I can Ooh. talk to you about it after? Sure. She kind of smiles into her, her stew. Uh, Harriet uh, asks uh, a bit more of, of Silas just sort of like so uh, do you work for the blacksmith often and uh, sort of innocuous questions yeah he's like no not uh, normally I perform on the docks but uh... oh you're a performer well then uh, yes maybe I should insist that you pay for a little meal with a song And Jonas is like, oh, yes, that, that would be great. I can go get my uh, my uh, lyre. It's um, 
not in great shape, but I'm sure I can half hold a tune. Sure. Um, yeah, he'll sing a sea shanty. Uh, uh, he'll get up and he'll be walking around while he sings and uh, occasionally checking out the door to make sure that the cart is okay. But being a little subtle about that. Uh, Jonas does go and retrieve his uh, his his lyre. Uh, and in fact, the lyre has a crank on the side. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen a, a hurdy-gurdy, but it's actually closer to a hurdy-gurdy than it is a lyre. You, f you get the impression that he probably couldn't play a lyre. Uh, but this thing, he's able to kind of crank out a, a, a tune. He tries to follow the song. Um, it's more... Uh, uh, he's not anywhere near as good as you are. Um, so he, he kind of slows down and at a certain point just stops playing. Uh, kind of half fascinated with what you're doing and also a little embarrassed that he couldn't really keep up. Uh, I will I'll, ask... uh, and I'll sing it in a way so it's not too hard to keep up with. Okay. Uh, Harriet uh, joins in uh, with a surprisingly beautiful voice. Um, it's not a it's not a, a hearty voice. It's instead one of those beautiful lyrical voices, uh, and um, actually, all three of you make charisma saving throws. No shit. Also, I will ask what the sleight of hand roll was. Was I, I don't know if you were trying to sneak the sleight of hand roll in on, on me or what? Uh, I, I was gonna say once you once you finish talking, uh, I would like to pocket my ring. Okay. <laughs> Easily enough done. Okay. Um, any you've heard some some beautiful singers before, um, and Silas is a very qualified singer. He knows his he knows his music. There's a a, a feature of Harriet's voice which you you can't quite pin it down. There's something very special about it. There's something almost uh, almost. Uh, uh, engrossing about her voice um, and you kind of think about it a little bit but uh, you kind of focus on the words and, and Silas's performance and kind of draw them back for Silas and Medrick um, both of you feel um, the pull of her voice and it, at a certain point Silas you find yourself kind of holding back on singing as strongly to let her voice take the lead and you almost start to play a little bit more to the voice rather than your own song. Um, for you, Medric, it's it's more of um, the the engrossing performance that both Silas and Harriet are putting on is mesmerizing. When cool. they finally finish the song, you realize you've been holding the spoon full of stew halfway to your mouth, probably for the last five minutes. And then you kind of take the stew. Hopefully nobody saw that. <laughs> so, does Silas feel that there is anything magical about that, or anything unusual? Uh, yes. There was definitely a magical element beneath the voice. Silas would know this more than more than most, uh, being kind of a little more exposed to magic. As you glance out too once in a while and kind of look out the front door, uh, you see uh, 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 Henry and uh, Angus. Uh, Angus uh, ruffles Henry's hair at one point, and they seem to be playing uh, catch with one of the base or one of the uh, the apples. Uh, Henry's obviously gone back for more since then, um, and uh, you also see that that uh, Angus is kind of checking out the horse. Um, in a way that it reminds you of the, the livery people. He doesn't have a horse here, but he clearly knows horses. Mm. Um, Silas wants to think about her voice and magic and see if he can figure out what was going on. Never mind. <laughs> voice. It, it is a thing that escapes people's mouths. <laughs> Even while you were experiencing it, there was a surreality to her voice. And while you can't quite pin what it was, um, when she stops singing and when she's just speaking, that energy is not there anymore. 
Um, and you almost get the impression that she wasn't aware of it either. Jonas, already clearly and has been mentioned as being in love with his wife, has this smitten look on his on his face uh, and, and just uh, kind of sighs contentedly. And that, ladies and gentlemen, that is my wife. Um, we have, uh, are there any tales of sirens? Um, or is that something we've heard of? There are all kinds of weird... You can just kind of assume that a lot of those mythological tales have translated over. Um, uh, you have uh, the voice of the sirens, milady. Uh, and she kind of uh, 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 blanches and then goes red in the cheeks from that. Ah, uh, well, you're you're all you're way too kind, <laughs> but thank you. You are an incredible player. Uh, I I have been happy to have the beautiful music playing in the tower, and she she kind of hesitates and then kind of looks over at uh, Jonas, who still has the hurdy gurdy kind of on his lap. It's okay, dear. You can say it. I'm not great with this thing. But you've got to admit, it, it doesn't take as much talent as a regular thing like what he's playing. Actually, he's just playing his uh, voice. Oh, I thought you were playing a guitar or something. Uh, I don't... Uh, actually, uh, he just has performance. He doesn't... He, he's not actually trained in any instruments. Okay, well... Um, I can play your guitar. He's hard-ish but uh, not actually a bird. Okay. He's bird ad adjacent. Right. Mm. Well, we'll say that you were accompanying with sort of wordless uh, rhythms and things as well as she was speaking, or she was singing. Um, but she uh, she kind of turns uh, a little bit red-faced towards the uh, fire. Oh, the oh. pie is done. <laughs> kind of distracting. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, pulls that off uh, and and sets the pie on the on the table. Now that will take a few minutes to cool, so... Um, it smells amazing and it, it it really really does it looks kind of amazing as well um, she kind of looks towards the, the door which is still kind of open uh, they don't ha seem to have to worry about it the wind doesn't seem to be blowing in here as, as much as is everywhere else uh, at, uh, at uh, uh, Angus far off and maybe just a little something to help sweeten things she goes over to the cupboard kind of moves aside this uh, this large uh, 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 clay pot, and you can see there's a, a small uh, bottle uh, in behind it uh, to to sweeten your tea. And she goes to pour uh, what looks like brandy uh, into uh, your teacups. <sighs> nice. Uh, 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 thank you, but uh, uh, no, thank you. I will gladly accept it. <laughs> Uh, and just, just a little bit. Um, it is a, a crude brandy. This is not your top shelf stuff. This is the stuff that's made probably with a little bit too much sugar and with a little bit less. Uh, it's definitely homemade. Um, nice. uh, but it it mixes well with the still warm tea and it does have a nice, nice sort of uh, uh, opening effect on the palate. Um and she asks for a couple more songs. This time she's going to stay, uh, stop singing. And uh, Jonas kind of taking the the hint of of uh, of Harriet's. Why don't we let the guests play? Uh, puts away the uh, the hurdy gurdy uh, and asks for a couple more songs while the pie cools. Um, sure. Kind of unnerved when he said like guests being plural, but I'm just going to sit here until called upon. <laughs> <laughs> You're the pyro guy. Uh, they I can did, make a light. I will say that, that Jonas did kind of use the the story that they had con that you guys had concocted. Well, he had kind of concocted, and Harriet just sort of smiled and nodded as if she probably knows what really happened. But at the same time, eh, this metric seems kind of strange and entirely plausible. <laughs> and Jonas does, Jonas doesn't seem to be upset or worried, at least not about this. So that he kind Fair. of accepts it. We were just talking about religion, really. <laughs> Have you heard Ignis? Yeah. <laughs> Knock on your door at eight in the morning. Um, 
after uh, a little while, you can actually, as you look out to uh, Silas, you can see that the water has been rising this entire time. It's still a little bit ways from the uh, full the full tide, uh, but now uh, the water is almost to the bottom of the the uh, the dock side, um, and. Uh, uh, yeah, Jonas actually will be the one once he puts away the hurdy gurdy to go into that antechamber on the outside and take out the small boat and kind of drag it into the to the water. Uh, it's a very it's small, small boat. okay. It's a very small boat with two people. It makes it pretty easy. I won't be long now. And you can see that where right. the the water washed up onto the beach, it's almost where your cart actually was. It's pretty shallow towards the top part, but. Um, that's how much the uh, the water has actually grown. Uh, and Silas will use uh, illusion to uh, 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 silent image uh, to uh, uh, with the song. So it'll portray oh, okay. what he's singing. But mostly stories. So um, it'd be funny if he was a mimic and he used silent illusion to create a guitar. <laughs> Bring this totally my guitar. You could make an air guitar. That would work. <laughs> to air guitar as human. Uh, you, uh, as you're kind of getting the the, the boat ready, uh, the the pie has been cooling, and uh, Harriet uh, serves it uh, out to those that are there. Um, it is as uh, as expected. Uh, a very flavorful pie. There's actually a little bit of extra cinnamon, so it has a little extra kick of heat than you weren't quite expecting. Uh, but the fresh apples uh, give that sort of beautiful, bitter, sweet taste to the pie, uh, and it's very, very filling. Um, uh, Angus and and uh, uh, Henry are still outside. Um, kind of, uh, Angus has taken to another another pipe full of of tobacco. Uh, and uh, carefully has wrapped it uh, and put it inside an inside pocket. You would have noticed this before. Uh, I think uh, maybe Silas would have noticed that he has a, 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 a leather pouch that he wraps the whole thing in. It's probably waterproof uh, as mm -hmm. well. Uh, humidity. Mm. Uh, Silas will offer to take... Uh pie out to the two who are outside. Uh, they'll be in soon enough, says Harriet, although she does set aside some pie uh, to make sure there are slices for them. Um, so far as you noticed, uh, Henry, or, uh, sorry, Angus didn't actually eat. He took the food out to Henry instead. Um, but that's probably, you know, old man jeans. <laughs> um, I'll eat eventually. <laughs> probably. Uh, the, but after a moment of the pie being full, um, Jonas does say, I think the water is deep enough now. That when you first put the boat in the water, it actually uh, sank to below the edge of the, uh, the the walkway, making it very awkward to get in and out of. Uh, but by now, it's actually floating almost even with it. He tied it off. Um, and uh, hands, you, hands you an oar, essentially. Sure. The boat's not big, but uh, a few of you should be able to get on board the boat and load it up and then bring it back. Um, is the weight of that thing going to make the boat sink? Oh, I'm sure it won't sink much. Uh, I'll, uh, I'm joking. It, it's, a, it's a good boat. It's not. It doesn't look like much, but I've sealed it all up. It, it, maybe not all three of you at the same time. Yeah, yeah I can, I'll, I'll stay over here. I can load the crate into the boat, no problem. Okay, hop so in. I'll go first. Then you guys go back without me and come back and pick me up. I'm not going to make you work out the full, you know, missionaries uh -huh. and and uh, <laughs> uh, the the worst one of those is no. Let me say fox and hen. I think that was the one that. How do you get the hens and the foxes across the the water? You can uh -huh. get the foxes and the hens together uh, <laughs> without the without the shepherd being with them. I think something like that. Um, yeah. I'm not going to make you work out that full full detail. We'll assume that's going on in the background. And no, no accidents happened. Yeah. <laughs> um, meanwhile, though, while Silas and, and Medrick are engaged with that, 
Jonas is on this side, um, which can help because uh, if you toss him the rope, he, he can actually pull the the uh, the boat in a little bit and tie it up to the dock. But uh, uh, Esther comes over to Annie. Sounds like an interesting book. And she kind of looks conspiratorially over at uh, at her mother. It really is. I don't think they really understood what this book was. I mean, it, it does cover history. What else, then? She kind of pulls the book to her chest, sighs a little bit. Love. Doll. Oh, that sounds fun. I thought it was going to be a magic book. God damn it. But I'm not here. <laughs> it, it tells all about this 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 princess and this prince and, and how they found each other. And the beautiful places that they went, and the terrible wars they fought in, and the the, the victories they had, and and <sighs> I'm sure I'm learning at least a little bit of history. Can I make a history check? Certainly can. Does this ring a bell? Uh, it kind of does, um, but it's it's weird. So the kingdom of Icro is a very old kingdom, or was a very old kingdom, but it was absorbed by the kingdom of Alaria when Alaria made an expansion in its movement about 500 years ago. Uh, and they, they went from their one small island to take over the entire, first of all, the entire collection of islands that they had nearby them, and then sailing southward this collection of islands, including Icro and Eskis, uh, and, uh, and even almost as far as the Perfume Reef, although no one claims that. It's not big enough to be claimed. Um, so this would be, uh, in fact, it was um, the kingdom of Alaria was overthrown by the kingdom of S of, of Icro. So that while everybody thinks of it being the expansionist activities of the kingdom of Alaria, it was actually the failure of the original kingdom of Alaria and the overthrow of the kingdom uh, king of Icro who then moved the seat to, to Alaria. Just to make it more complicated, they moved the seat to Alaria. So for many of the peasants throughout that time period, they technically always said they were loyal to the kingdom of Alaria. And they were. It's just that the kingdom of Alaria itself shifted from one family to another. Interesting. And so far as, as you've read, um, it is actually that same family which rules the kingdom today. good to know but she kind of focuses as much on the salacious details as salacious as you get in a sort of semi-scholarly work but clearly the <laughs> person what was that historical fiction <laughs> kind of yeah yeah and you've you've heard other stories of this era and the 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 prince and princess were not as um they got a lot lucky more than they got completely skilled um, but it's not the only ballad or story that you've read that, that kind of touts their, their fame. This one doesn't mention much of the later stuff, though, um, where they overthrow the king of Alaria and take the throne. This one kind of is just their, their formative years, if you will, their rise to power, um, their defeat of a hag, a tragic death of one of their children, and the sort of paranoia which followed that for many, many years. Me, the player, this is this is the pixie. Uh, this is, yeah, well, very, yeah, yeah. Uh, there were things that they had done to try to ensure that none of their other children died. And one of that was the creation of a magic item. Yo. Uh, once you get the boat over, Angus is also willing to help. Um, despite him being somewhat bowed over and much, much older than all of you, um, you quickly discover that he's built like a friggin' ox. Um, and almost by himself, he can take the crate off and walk it over, but he does accept help. Uh, in, 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 in some ways, it's not that he accepts help, he expects you to help. Because oh, yeah. this is your delivery mm -hmm. still to be made. Um, but, uh, so I guess like, I'll grab one half of the crate and he'll grab the other or something. Essentially, yeah and then puts it onto the boat. 
Um, and then he's just going to wait there. He knows that he can't fit on the boat with everyone else, and he's not yes, going to carry the thing again. Uh, so you pull the, the boat back over. Jonas on the other side, extraordinarily eager, uh, is is uh, there to help and kind of not nearly as strong as, as uh, the grand or the father-in-law, but uh, with, uh, I guess, Silas's help. The two of you kind of, he kind of wraps a couple of ropes around it, uh, using some leverage uh, principles and a, and a very strong pillar on the inside, kind of helps to pull it into the area. Um, and then uh, he would ask that uh, maybe go and retrieve Medric and, and, and give me a hand getting this up to the top of the tower. Sure. And then, Silas uh, comes the boat around and rows his way back. Even now, even though it hasn't been that long a time, the tide has, has already been dropping a little bit. So that's the, when you make the return trip back, instead of stepping directly from the boat onto the little dock uh, slash deck, you actually have to use one of the ladders, which is attached to one side. Um, but you make it back up. And, you know, with a enthusiasm carrying where strength cannot... Uh, and certainly with uh, Medric and Silas's help, the three of you managed to get the crate up to the very top. Uh, and uh, he already has a crowbar, because he also has a crowbar on hand at all times. Uh, opens up the crate. <laughs> opens up the crate. Uh, <laughs> and and kind of get, gets your help to lift the thing out of the center. Um, it's actually remarkably small compared to the size of the box. Uh, but it's stuffed absolutely full with uh, with straw. And what it appears to be is a hemispherical dome. Uh, the dome has uh, alchemical markings on the outside, but you're not really sure if they're magical in nature so much as they are instructive in nature. Uh, it has several spouts and a lot of different twists and turns on the top. Uh, and, but it manages, but it clamps shut. So he kind of demonstrates that the idea is that once it's clamped shut over the, the actual um, uh, stone itself, um, you can use the other parts along with the gears that he's been developing to actually be able to, to tighten the beam and actually focus it more strongly or to diffuse it. Um, or in, it also points to several new crystals he wants to install in the windows or to angle it off those crystals. So part of it is that the beam will no longer go at, at eye level height, the danger that will no longer be there. Uh, part of it is that he can focus it even brighter, but in a smaller area. Uh, to our modern sensibilities, it'd be like a laser. Um, but there's a considerable amount there just as shielding. And part of what you realize is the interior of this thing is lined with lead. Uh, thick, heavy lead, then lined with... Uh, Lined with a layer of silver, and then lined with a layer of uh, metal on the outside, probably iron, which is what contributes it to being so heavy. Um, he already has uh, a chain in place in the room to be able to maneuver it in place, which uh, he's <coughs> probably going to do tomorrow, because he doesn't want to mess with it when there's still a storm raging. They prefer everyone that way. Yep. Silas will stand there for a bit going, oh... That goes there. That goes there. Huh. Jonas is over the moon that anybody's paying closer attention to it. And he kind of overwhelms you a bit with extra explanation, which I think part of it does flow out the years. But um, A little bit. My intelligence is only 16. The Well, the, the, the thing is, the thing that you realize is that he has claimed to have no knowledge of magic. But there are deep magical principles involved in the design and building of this. You're actually surprised that Wish could have built this because you're pretty sure that he does not know magic from a sunbeam. Maybe he had help. Hmm. Well. Good luck, Jonas. Try not to burn any of the ships. Oh, I would never... I mean, oh, that... You don't think that that would... No, 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 no. That, it'll be fine. Yeah, thank you all for your help. Well, uh, if there were ever to be invading ships, I'm sure it could be used. Make an insight. What am I adding to... Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, 
One quick inside check from Medrick and explanation. I'll get back to you, Annie. Inside check? Yes. All right. Where is my window? Whoop. When you mentioned that, you know, were there ships that needed to be damaged or something like that, you kind of get that feeling of he already thought of that. <laughs> But he hasn't. He doesn't want to say it out loud, and you get the impression that he doesn't really want to emphasize that point to anyone else. But he definitely no, but like, already thought of that. Yeah. It's just for a mad rag, like having been on a warship before and in wars before. It's like that's the first thing that came to his mind. <laughs> if, if this works, if this works like you suspect it might, and as well as he thinks it is, Dud, this would be coastal defense of yeah. a major level. Uh, Annie, you were looking into something. Um, what I'll add to the conversation about the book, uh, okay. I'll add some of the stories of that that I've heard. Esther is extraordinarily keen to hear from someone who knows more stories than you do than she does, and actually, she pauses you for a minute, goes and grabs some paper, and tries to write it all down. These are just from the books that that I read as a kid too. And she's just, I, I only have the one book right now. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping we can get another one. Or maybe I can even visit a library somewhere. I know the Baron has a very well-stocked library. And, well, I, I've heard that a few others in town do. But I'm not sure if they would allow me to read from them. <sighs> to be surrounded by books all day there's a chance that when she kind of lowers her voice and looks over at, at her mother there's a chance that maybe I can study in Pitajun. Okay. I the lighthouse is important and I get that and I'm proud of it but I don't know if I can spend my whole life here Dad I get was, that Dad was a merchant. He he grew up in Pitajun. He tells me stories sometimes. It sounds like an amazing place. I'd love to see it. Uh, Mom's always been here. She's always felt good here. Although when she went into town and met Dad, I, I'm, I'm sure that made a difference in her life too. I'd like a chance to meet someone like that. Yeah. Sometimes you need to do learn things your own way. Yeah. Are you staying in Ilthwater? Right now, yes. For a little bit. Please tell me where you're staying. I don't get into town much, but I'm old enough that they'll let me do the, the run into town for supplies, so I might We're be able to... We're right now. Oh, I like that place. Nice. I, uh... Maybe I'll get a chance to see you again. She seems extraordinarily excited by the opportunity. Sure. If you're in town, let, let me know. We can talk some more. You can tell me more stories. Definitely. After a while, um, the boat having been delivered back out, uh, the delivery having been made, uh... Silas, you kind of remember the, the roll of paper that was handed to you by uh, by Yuri. Yes. Um, I asked Jonas's wife, who is in charge here who can sign for this? Uh, Harriet kind of smiles. Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm sure any of us can. I'm sure that Jonas might want to just because this is kind of his project. I'm also sure that Angus won't. <laughs> Jonas it is. Thank you. And he, I'll go get Jonas. he enthusiastically signed. It's, it, he's got a very blockish style of writing. Um, very precise and very uh, clear. Um, you can kind of imagine all caps or, or small caps, I guess would be the, the name of it. Uh, kind of an engineering style as well. Very cr clearly writes Jonas Cromley. Thank you, sir. Thank you again. It was very nice to meet you. 
You're not at all like the Marshes I've heard of. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Mm. No, it's... Uh, it's been said a lot. I, sorry. A smile. A, uh, thank you very much. It was nice to meet you. They say things about the phrase as well. I... Well, I met Harriet and everything changed, so... Yeah, that happens. Uh, well, have a good day, sir. You too. And he's already kind of turning towards the thing and turning it, well, kind of looking at it from different sides and measuring and, and seems to be making little little sounds of, of oh, ah, oh, aha, yes, kind of thing going on. He's already absorbed in that. Are we all like upstairs where Angus is not? Angus is still out by the by the wagon. Okay. Um, he didn't feel like wading through the water to get back in. Um, so if we're all about to leave, I'll just give him a small reminder. And it's like, if you're ever in uh, Elfwater again, remember to stop by the Temple of Ignis. We can continue the conversation. Yes, yes. Maybe I can take a closer look at the at the the Everflame. There might be some properties I'm able to figure out. Do you know how they're made? Hmm. Uh, is that like a int answer or like a religion, religion. answer that you want? Religion answer would be the one you'd be looking okay. for. I'll just explain the process of how it's done and what requirements are necessary. Like, it's a little bit obscure. And how much, like, which parts that hurt and which parts that hurt less? <laughs> well, it's a little bit obscure because the 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 ever flame itself is is a is a. Um, it is one of the sort of sacred secrets in some ways. Oh, uh, shit, it is? Not that it exists, but they don't really teach initiative, initiates how it's made. Um, there's okay. a sort of, there's a sort of, in the early levels of the doctrine, there would be essentially, you know, it is, it is a sign of Ignis blessing this place. And, and it is a, a you know, the, the reason that exists is because Ignis has favored us. As you go up a little bit more, it's that they they actually uh, bring the the uh, the ever flame. It's not created; it's brought. Okay. Um, so they actually bring in uh, sealed versions of the flames of Ignis and distribute them, um, and that's because they come from uh, the a central mountain where all of the flames actually originate. Um, which so would I'll be explain. which would be something you would know at this point. Yeah. So in a way, it's kind of like that stone inside that that, that, peru that peruses the light. I wonder if they're connected. Huh. That's, well, they felt the same. They were well, similar anyway. It's unlikely that I'm going to be uh, in Elthwater anytime soon, but um, maybe I'll, uh, I'll, I'll I'll look it up next time I'm there. Awesome. And as you kind of gather for the evening, it, is, it has grown to be, you know, early evening. It's not quite dark yet. For you, Medric, it's like the midday, practically. Um, the, oh, yeah. <laughs> getting used to this, this site is, is a little bit unnerving, uh, and it extends quite a distance. Um, and unlike some of the other dark sites, you actually do see color. Um, in fact, everything is kind of washed out because it's overly bright. Silas, Annie, and Medrick, all three of you can fit on the small boat to go back. And, and by now, again, a, a couple of rungs down on the ladder from the deck uh, as, you, as you row back out. Uh, Angus meets you uh, with uh, Edry kind of, or Henry, uh, kind of uh, reluctantly in tow. You get the feeling that spending the evening with the horse was probably the funnest thing he's done for a long time. Uh, and actually, you know, he kind of trails along in his grandfather's shadow, but... Um, you have seen, Silas, that while Angus has a, a harsh exterior, especially when dealing with anybody who's an adult, um, when alone with, with Henry, or feeling like he was alone with Henry, there's a lot more closeness there. Um, but Lundy's mane is, is woven into the strangest mohawk anyone's ever seen. Fix <laughs> <laughs> your horse for you. Uh, thank you. Also, probably a little bit uh, hyper from a lot of apples. Um, but Angus meets you by the shore and grabs the end of the the boat pretty pretty steadily to to let you off. Thank you for your delivery. 
You're welcome. Glad to help. You're, um, you're not bad for a marsh, I guess. Thank you. Hmm. And uh, he and Henry get on the boat. They ride back and uh, drag the boat in with them afterwards. And actually looking at it now, one of the, the interesting things is when high tide is in, it's practically got a moat around it so that you could get there by water. You could wade in over the, over, uh, the, the land, but it would be easily over your head um, if you weren't careful. And the, uh, the s- distribution of stones that's right around the base of it are also kind of uneven. Uh, but they pull that in. I would have brought the, the crate of spices and shit. Brought that back? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Just being specific. Yeah. <laughs> I'm assuming you kind of stuffed it with your coat on the outside, so nobody really paid much attention to it. Uh, it's a little bit odd, but clearly it means something to you, and no one really paid much attention to it. Or smelt the coffee. <laughs> <laughs> um, true. Yeah, that could start riots. Uh, you get back on the wagon, and I'm assuming you're heading back towards Yelthwater. Is that correct? Yep. Okay. Night settles in. And it feels as though the storm, which has been raging all day, is dissipating somewhat. But there's that that weird mix of hot and cold, indicating there's still a thunderstorm to be had. And indeed, you see bright flashes of heat lightning from time to time. And behind you, you see the ever-present lighthouse with its light sweeping across the land. Now that you've been exposed to it up close, um, you actually can feel when it sweeps over land and feel that light. Uh, Medric, for you, it is a bright and illuminating beam. For the rest of you, there's just a slight change, uh, partially because now you're more aware of it. You didn't even notice it on the way in, even though the light would have passed over you. I hold up my hand and watch the x-rays like burn through the... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's uh, new. Uh, the fog itself seems to be almost cut through by this. A little bit of heat lightning rumble off in the distance. The horses, apparently so contented with the massive amount of attention and meals it got today, it doesn't even seem to bat an ear, even though the thunder at one point gets very loud. The water now is starting to recede back from the, the, uh, the shore. Um, you know that along a lot of places here, uh, usually not late at night like this, but when the, when the water recedes, it's often when people go and try to find clams or other things that have washed up um, well, you can see little bits of, of driftwood here and there. I'll and say a very quiet uh, prayer under my breath for the uh, person who may have gotten pulled overboard. Maybe Marina hears you. Maybe that's just the way that the wind is lapping with the, the water, water, but it's it's almost as though you can hear an echo across the water. Uh-oh, we better move faster. I think it's zombies. About a half an hour of walking along. You haven't quite made it back to that spot where you'd seen the burned out wagon. And you're walking towards the road and and Marina actually is on the horizon. Marius will not be rising for another couple of hours. Medric. Yeah, I'm assuming I'm leading the gang because like 120 feet dark vision. Yeah, you can easily see ahead of you. Um, and then at one Glancing point, right to make sure there's no ambushes. In fact, you can make out small animals moving in the woods. Um, you can sense almost any form of life around you. Cool. Medric's eyes in the dimming light seem to glow brighter and brighter. It was easy to kind of ignore when you were inside because it was only a dim glow, despite the weird burning around his eyes and that forth. But then they flare suddenly, brightly, emitting a light that kind of is almost like as bright as torchlight in front of you, only for an instant. And then it goes back to where it was, but then everything else seems a bit dimmer. It goes back to what it was like before I stared into the light or like? No. So it flares up and then returns back to that enhanced sense still. Okay. But everything around you seems a little dimmer. 
and what had become almost a pulse of otherworldly energy from the beam washing across the area. You expect it after a certain point. And now, you don't feel it. And as you look back, you see that the lighthouse is dim. How, how long have we been traveling? About a half an hour. We might want to go back and check on them. Yeah. Uh, it's not supposed to happen, and that's going to be bad for any ships. You can just make out a ship on the horizon with uh, Marina kind of glowing brightly, the moon just behind it, so you can make out the silhouette of the ship. It's not the only one coming in. Yeah, we got a race. Yeah. All right, back we go. Turn the card around. The horse now picking up on the in, the uh, extra energy. The concern whinnies a bit. And you barrel back down the road you just came. And I think that's where we're going to call it for today. And Medrek is thinking, like, did I just fuck everything up? <laughs> it's starting to get warm in here, I just realized. As I keep describing, like, humidity and heat and... <laughs> Bright like, lights, fire. Like, oh yeah, I'm sweating. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I forgot the fan ahead under the table till about one o'clock. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I want to thank you very much, folks, for for playing. Looks like we had somebody stop by, stop by. Not really sure if they were a bot or not. I'm kind of wondering. Uh, but uh, at least if someone did enjoy the game, and that's great. Even robots deserve to have good fun D and D. Uh, if you want to find out more about it or you want to join in a discussion, uh, I think what I will do is I will clean up slightly here in a minute or two the uh, descriptions I gave of the dreams because uh, that's something that uh, you guys need as well. And I'll yeah. post that up on our... I'll post that on the, the, the page, uh, the web page, the Facebook page, pardon me, Legends of the Drowned yeah. Dials, which, uh, Marie, uh, you give the rest of the spiel for that. Uh, and then we also have the group Watches of the Drowned Isles, which is more of a conversation group. Yeah, I've I've not had a chance to start discussions lately. I will try to do that and, and, and poke and prod. Um, you will also, hopefully, if you've watched this live, know that you are watching this at twitch.tv slash ENCAF1 and CAF1. That's me. I'm Mark the Encaffeinated One. I name things after myself. Uh, but uh, if you are not watching this on Twitch, you may be watching this YouTube. Or if you're watching on the other, then you know that the other is there. Wait, this is getting complicated. YouTube.com slash ENCAF1. I'll post the episodes in a couple of days uh, so you get a chance to watch and catch up and meet the Frey family, um, as these folks just did. Uh, they seem very nice. The Freys are, 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 are fun. Um, and yet more to come still as well. Uh, anything else that I've forgotten? I don't know if I've forgotten ring anything. Ring the bell to subscribe. It's true. Uh, please, uh, please subscribe. Uh, ring the bell on YouTube and it will happen. You'll get a notification when a new episode goes up. Uh, otherwise, uh, let us know. I'm changing slightly the, the layout of things. We didn't get to a map screen today, but that's changing. If you have suggestions about how things can change, if you have, uh, thoughts about how the... The, uh, the the game is run, I'd love to hear them. I may not pay attention to them all, because especially if they're negative thoughts, but I, I will at least be happy to hear from you. Uh, I want to thank um, George84. Uh, I think that's right. Pat, you, you know better than I. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yep. He is a, George Silva. George Silva, a, a, a brilliant artist um, who uh, we got to do some portraits for us. And uh, he's always looking forward to doing more. And I still have not... Of the 2,000 characters I have, I haven't decided which ones I want to get illustrated yet uh, and then kind of line those up, but I would encourage you to do so. Links will be in the end and also in the description on YouTube. Other than that, uh, have a great day. Thanks for playing, folks. Thanks for running. And we Thanks. shall see you a goal. All see you a goal. See you a goal. Like a seagull. <laughs> Next week.